The Life of Natsuki Subaru ReZero Natsuki Subaru is the main protagonist of ReZero Kata Hajimaru Isekai Sekatsu, or ReZero Starting Life in Another World. He was a Hikikomori who was transported to the world of Lagunica by unknown means and was given the ability to return from death by Satella. He officially became Amelia's knight following the incident at the Sanctuary and is later revealed to have the necessary qualifications to become a Sage Candidate. Welcome to the Imagi. In today's video, we're going over the life of Natsuki Subaru. Before we begin, we publish a new video almost every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. The Imagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. I also have a bit of a cold, so please bear with me. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get into the video. Background Subaru is first seen at a local Japanese convenience store on a normal evening snack run. After leaving the store, he somehow ends up in a fantasy world after the atmosphere around him distorts itself. Confused by the happenings around him, Subaru soon realizes that he's been sucked into another world. Back in his original world, Subaru was the only son to two odd but well-meaning parents. From a young age, Subaru idolized his dad in particular, a popular man in his community who was highly talented in whatever he did, a loving father who prioritized his family above everything else, and had a boisterous personality that charmed anyone he met. Kenichi was everything he wanted to be, and growing up around him had a huge influence on Subaru's life. Taking pride in being his son, Subaru worked to live up to the expectations that came with that in his mind. For a time, he achieved this, as Subaru found himself smarter, more physically able, and popular than his peers. When he received praise, Subaru would often hear how it was expected of him being Kenichi's son, which made him feel special and entitled to a sense of superiority. However, as the young boy's small world started to gradually expand upon entering middle school, Subaru would soon come face to face with the limits of his own abilities. Suddenly, he found people who were becoming smarter and faster than he was, and in general being better at the things he used to be the best at. He felt as if he was slowly losing his place and began to harbor a deep sense of shame at letting down his parents and fear of everyone leaving him due to his failures, doubt, and self-loathing beginning to develop in his heart. But rather than prioritize getting better at these things to combat his anxieties, Subaru instead placed more importance on doing daring and outrageous things to maintain his fragile dignity and keep himself the center of attention. However, the more reckless Subaru's actions became, the fewer people wanted to be around him. Yet Subaru continued to deceive himself and believe his own lies because, as the son of his seemingly indomitable father, he couldn't be seen as a failure. Eventually, one day, Subaru noticed that he no longer had any friends, and in his loneliness, Subaru realized that he wasn't anyone special. From then on, the comparisons between his father and himself turned into a curse that wounded and suffocated him everywhere he went, yet his strong admiration for his dad made it impossible to show that pain to anyone. Eventually, he stopped trying to stand out, and when high school came, he found himself in a new environment where no one knew his past. Seizing this opportunity, Subaru tried to build new interpersonal relationships, but he had no idea how to be himself around others, and instead only ended up emulating his father, his only frame of reference, which instead led to others to treat him as a clown, and classmates simply ignored his existence altogether. One day, Subaru skipped a day of school out of a lack of enthusiasm, which slowly turned into a constant thing until at one point, he hadn't been to class for three months. When out of public spaces, Subaru felt liberated, but more than that, his own degradation meant people would start distancing him from Kenichi, and in a twisted sense of hope, his parents come to acknowledge him as worthless and cast him aside. Natsuki Subaru has been summoned to another world. He doesn't know the reason for his unexpected appearance in this fantasy world. Initially, he set himself upon the belief that he was the destined protagonist of this new fantasy world. Thus, he assumed and acted according to this false belief. When he meets Kataman, a vendor in the streets, he learns that he can't read the language of this world. The vendor asked him to buy some of his apples. When Subaru showed him his coins from his world, the vendor told him that the coin he was using was foreign and needed to use the national currency. When Subaru told him that he's broke, the vendor yelled at him as he was disturbing his business. Subaru leaves to search for more information on the world. Eventually, he encounters misfortunes, such as entering the girl's bathroom, which results in a slap to the face, entering the Demi-Humans Inn, which results in him falling from the bridge across the river, and meeting three thieves named Tone, Chin, and Khan who are ready to rob him. Subaru is saved by a half-elf girl, who, after learning that Subaru is unfamiliar with the local history, geography, and language, introduces herself as Satella and her companion, Puck. He decides to return the favor by retrieving her insignia that was stolen by a thief named Felt. Subaru and Satella travel to the loot house where Felt was going to sell the insignia only to find her dead, and shortly after entering, they're also killed. 
Subaru's special ability, Return by Death, activates, and he finds himself reset back at the moment he was speaking with the vendor. Obviously, Subaru is quite confused by everything that's going on. Unaware of his power and resurrection, Subaru decides to head out again to the loot house. This time, he meets Felt and Rom, and negotiates with them for the insignia. Elsa, the person who killed Subaru in the first timeline, arrives, and Subaru offers his cell phone, whose camera feature is perceived to be more valuable than the money Elsa has. So, Felt and Rom accept his offer. However, Elsa kills everybody again after Subaru states his intention to return the insignia to its original owner. Subaru responds once again, this time greeting Satella in the street, but she becomes immediately offended because Satella is the name of the Witch of Envy, which is taboo in this realm. Satella questions Subaru, asking him why he would call her that name. He doesn't know how to respond, causing Satella to leave. However, Felt took the opportunity to steal the crest, prompting Satella to accuse them of working together. He denied her accusation, but was unable to defend himself as she left. Chasing after her, Subaru found himself in a familiar alleyway, once again coming face to face with Tone Chin and Khan. Annoyed with their appearance, Subaru tried walking past them, only to accidentally get stabbed by Chin's knife. Frightened by the events, the three thugs ran off, leaving Subaru to die. Once he was dead, he returned once again to the save point in front of Kataman's store. After coming to his senses in front of the store, Subaru checked his body and supplies on a set of stairs nearby, coming to the conclusion that he has some ability to go back in time if he dies. As he walked around, he remembered Satella's actions and the events that would follow, ultimately deciding to help her again. Making his way back to Kataman, he asked him if he had seen a girl get robbed, learning that a girl who used magic had been robbed earlier. Subaru finds himself face to face with the three thugs again, this time opting for the strategy of screaming for help. The three thugs are relieved when nothing happens, though they become scared when Reinhard Van Astria appears, deciding to run away as they know they can't beat him. Subaru thanked Reinhard for his help, and asked him to tell a silver-haired girl to not go to the stolen goods warehouse if he was ever to run into her. Then Subaru left to go there as fast as he could. Once he arrived in the slums, Subaru asked people the location of Felt's house. However, on his way there, he bumped into Elsa, immediately remembering what she had done in the past. Elsa was curious about his behavior, but decided to leave him alone, allowing him to keep on going to his destination. He took a look around Felt's house while he waited for her to come back, causing her to mistake him as a robber and attack him. Subaru eventually managed to explain why he was there, and the two left together for Rom's warehouse. At Rom's warehouse, Subaru had his phone appraised, with Felt learning that it was indeed worth the money that he claimed it to be. Getting the answer he wanted, Subaru tried to get the deal over with as fast as possible, causing Felt to become suspicious of him. He tried to make an excuse to clear her suspicion, but ended up deepening it instead. Suddenly, everyone in the warehouse heard a knock on the door, causing Subaru to become afraid as he thought it was Elsa. To his surprise, the person in question was Satella, someone that he didn't expect to see at the warehouse. Subaru wonders if he had gotten there much faster because he wasn't there. Satella demanded that Felt return her crest, however Felt refused, prompting him to try to negotiate between them. At that moment, Subaru saw Elsa about to attack, causing him to order Puck to protect her. Her attack blocked, Elsa fell back, commenting that she's interested in splitting a spirit's stomach open, as she hadn't done so before. After Subaru's speech, Puck created a large number of ice projectiles to attack her, which Elsa blocked with her cloak. The two began fighting, each blocking the other's attack with their own weapon. After a while, Elsa noticed that her foot had been frozen to the ground, with Puck telling her that he purposely placed this ice around to trap her. She dodged his attack by cutting her own skin off, and later temporarily healed it with ice. She was disappointed that he was out of time, she continued to attack. At that point, Rom decided to join the fight and began attacking her, though he was quickly defeated. Seeing the battle wasn't going in their favor, Subaru ordered Felt to escape after saving her, telling her to run as far as she could. She was reluctant, but listened to his words while he picked up Rom's club to join the fight. Even with him joining, the fight continued in Elsa's favor. However, everyone was surprised when Reinhard joined the fight, intent on finishing it quickly. Recognizing Elsa as the Bowel Hunter through her clothes, Reinhard recommended that she give up, to which he told them that she was going to refuse this offer. He suggested for her to give up once again after destroying one of her weapons, however, she still refused, attacking him once again with her spares. As he watched the battle, Subaru wondered if Reinhard was being pressed, though Satella explained that it was because she was using spirit magic, adding that she wouldn't be able to keep healing Rom if Reinhard became serious. Satella soon finished healing Rom and ordered Subaru to notify Reinhard about it. Seeing that they were finished, Reinhard finally became serious, using a Van Astrea sword technique that destroyed a huge portion of the warehouse. To everyone's surprise, Elsa burst out from the rubble, intent on killing Satella, though she was blocked once again by Subaru. 
Knowing she was at a disadvantage, Elsa retreated, telling everyone to treasure their bowels as she would one day cut them out. Later on, Subaru asked if Satella would tell him her name, learning that her name was actually Emilia. Reinhardt was relieved that Subaru was okay, but soon knew that he spoke too soon when he held up a destroyed club, with a slash wound appearing on Subaru's stomach moments later. Once Subaru collapsed, Reinhardt became curious about his and Amelia's relationship, asking her if she knew about him. Emilia answered that she had never seen him before, but it was strange, and Reinhardt added that Subaru had been looking for her. He offered to take Subaru off her hands, though she told him that she would take him back to her home. She then went over to Felt, asking her if Rom was like family to her, to which she told her that he was the only one who took care of her. As she returned Amelia's crest, Reinhardt noticed that the crest shone in her hands, causing him to grab her. Felt tried to resist, but was quickly knocked unconscious by Reinhardt, and he commented that it would probably be the last time he could peacefully look at the moon. At Amelia's home, the Rosswall Mansion, Subaru woke up in a bed, knowing that Amelia was the one who saved him, but he wondered where she was. Exiting the room, he tried walking down the corridor, only for it to seemingly loop on him, causing him to try the first door he saw, walking into Beatrice's library. After talking with her for a little bit, she sucked some mana from his body, causing him to lose consciousness. Later, Subaru woke up in a bed and decided to go back to sleep for the third time once he noticed he had woken up in the morning. Looking over at the source of the voices he was hearing, he saw two maids, prompting him to get excited when he realized that maids existed in this universe. At that moment, Emilia entered the room. Ignoring the maid's comment, she walked over to his bed, asking him if he was alright. Answering that he was mostly fine, Subaru addressed Emilia with Tan, making her wonder what that meant, though he quickly asked her to forget about it. The two went outside, with Subaru amazed at how big the mansion and the grounds were. He began doing some radio exercises and asked Amelia to join him, with Puck joining in at the end. After exchanging greetings, both maids asked for them to come back to the mansion as the head of the household had returned. Subaru became irritated once again with Beatrice's remarks and mistook Roswell L. Mathers as a clown, causing Roswell to introduce himself. Subaru asked the maids various questions during the meeting, such as what they were skilled at, surprising Roswell that he had no knowledge of anything in Lagunica. He explained that Lagunica currently didn't have a king, and that the government was currently being run by the Sage Council, further adding that there was going to be a royal election taking place soon. Subaru wondered why he was referring to Amelia with Sama, prompting Roswell to explain that she was more important than himself, with Amelia answering that she was a candidate to be the 42nd king of Lagunica. When told that he can have anything as a reward, Subaru asked for Roswell to employ him, causing everyone to be shocked. A while later, Subaru visited the clothing room with the others to look for clothes that matched his size. However, he ended up with clothes that were too big for him. Leaving his jacket with one of the maids, Rem, for her to fix, he had her sister, Ram, guide him around the mansion, showing him each of the rooms that he needed to know about. To his surprise, the door to the bathroom led to Beatrice's own room, and upon being seen, she became embarrassed and forced him out. Ram explained that it was Beatrice's door crossing, which he figured out to be that she could connect any door in the mansion to her own room. Although Ram told her that it was hard to find Beatrice again, Subaru easily found the door to her room again, annoying her even more. Once they were outside, Ram wrapped up her tour, asking if he had any questions. Seeing that he didn't have any, she told him to help with the work, taking a long time to list everything she had to do. It took him a whole day to finish all the work, and at night, Ram came by to drop off his fixed jacket. Five days later, Subaru finally found time to talk with Amelia on the grounds, complaining about his daily job as a butler. She was happy that he seemed to be enjoying his job as a butler, and was surprised when he asked her to go with him into the town the next morning. Nonetheless, she accepted his offer, and Subaru dropped by Beatrice's room before going to bed. The next morning, an excited Subaru stood on his bed and shouted, causing himself to become embarrassed when he saw that Ram and Rem were next to his bed. To his surprise, neither maid recognized him, and his surprise turned into horror as he saw his hands were clean, realizing he had somehow died and returned. Shocked that he had returned from death, Subaru looked at both Ram and Rem, trying to make sense of the whole situation. Confused by everything, Subaru ran from the room, eventually coming to a stop in Beatrice's library, earning a complaint from Beatrice herself for entering without knocking. He then learned from her that he had broken the door crossing hours earlier, causing him to realize where his current safe point was. After leaving the library, Subaru headed outside, waving to Amelia to get her attention. She had been worried about him ever since she heard from the twin maids that he had gone missing. Puck woke up partway through their conversation, prompting Subaru to ask to be able to pet him whenever he wanted to. The two then headed to the dining room where they had breakfast just like the last life. Expecting things to go the same way as his last life, Subaru asked if Roswell would employ him, but to his surprise, things didn't turn out the same way, with Ram forcing him to help Rem with her work. He was shocked even further when Roswell joined him in the bath. Once he left the bath, he was surprised to see Ram standing there waiting to help Roswell change into his clothes. 
She asked him if he had anything else to do that night, to which he told her that he didn't, causing her to mention that she should visit his room later. Later that night, Ram visited Subaru's room to teach him how to read and write, revealing that she would be able to take it easy if he learned it. Slightly annoyed by her remarks, he began practicing reading and writing through children's storybooks, eventually coming to enjoy learning the language. However, all of his newfound motivation disappeared when he noticed that Ram was busy sleeping on his bed. The following morning, Subaru changed into his work clothes, noting that there weren't any of Ram or Ram's clothes in the clothing room. She didn't mind at all, stating that she was just fine with their maid uniform, and tried to brush off all of his comments. Subaru went through the usual duties of cooking, cleaning, and taking care of the gardens before getting his hair cut by Rem. Later that night, Rem visited Subaru while he was cleaning the bath and apologized for her comments earlier about his hair. He agreed to forget about her comments as long as she cleaned his hair. She accepted his request and began helping him clean the bath, with Subaru instructing her to not touch his hair until he had fulfilled his promise with Amelia. The following day, Subaru visited Irlam village with Rem, getting tangled by the kids while she was busy shopping. The two talked as they returned home, with her smiling at his comment about Oni, though she threatened to tell on him for his supposed flirting. Emilia visited him that night instead of Ram, making him unable to focus on his learning, eventually causing him to ask her out on a date, to which she mistakenly assumed that he already went on a date with Rem. Reluctant at first, she eventually gave in to his pleading, agreeing to go with him into the village the following morning. However, after Amelia left, Subaru was assaulted by a terrible sense of nausea. Leaving his room, he walked for a little while down the hallway before he was attacked and killed by someone, forcing him to return back to the morning when he first met the twin maids. After dying to the unknown assailant, Subaru woke up once again in his bed, recalling that no one remembered him after seeing Ram and Rem were scared of his behavior. He then made his way to Beatrice's library, walking in circles around her while he gathered his thoughts, prompting her to yell at him. The two conversed for a while until she forcefully ejected him from the library, causing him to fall into the bushes outside. He was happy to see Amelia, but quickly changed his mind when she told him that Rem had added animal manure as fertilizer. Seeing him struggle to get rid of it, Amelia summoned Puck to help wash it off, to which Puck happily obliged by hitting Subaru with a tornado of water. A short while later, the three took a break on the lawn, with Subaru play-fighting with Puck for his water tornado earlier. The maid sisters soon appeared, informing them that Roswell had returned, and asked for their presence in the dining room. Breakfast went along as usual, during which time Subaru organized his thoughts, eventually coming to the conclusion that he would have an easier time searching for clues if he asked to live at the mansion instead of actually, you know, working there. Although he asked to live at the mansion, Subaru didn't know where to start investigating and eventually made his way into Beatrice's library. While there, he asked her about the methods of killing someone by weakening them, to which she told him of curses and her own mana drain, further adding that although she returned his mana, she wasn't obligated to return lost blood. Subaru didn't believe that she healed him, instead he thought that she was trying to steal credit from Amelia. However, she informed him that the girl didn't have any power to heal him, ejecting him outside seconds later. Later that day, Subaru still didn't have any clues and was busy contemplating the whole situation when Ram brought him tea, sitting on his bed to drink her own share. The topic of their conversation eventually shifted to children's stories, and he told her about the story of the red and blue Oni. Once he finished, Ram voiced her own opinion, and Subaru answered her question by telling her that he would be friends with both Oni. She then asked him about Lagunica's children's stories, causing him to pull out a book, opening it to the stories about the dragon and the witch. To his surprise, while Ram discussed the dragon with him, she refused to even mention anything about the witch. Leaving the room, she warned him to not mention the story about the Oni to Ram, mentioning that she would probably hate it. Three days later, on the fourth day, Subaru decided to leave the mansion, thinking that if he left, then the others wouldn't be targeted. Roswell mentioned that he added a bit more, which Subaru quickly realized was to keep him quiet until he agreed not to say anything. A while after leaving the mansion, he was attacked by the unknown assailant, whom he managed to force to reveal their identity. To his shock and horror, the assailant revealed herself as Rem, who then told him that she would have preferred for him to not realize what was happening. Subaru is shocked that Rem is the one who kept killing him. He flees and whilst running gets hit by Rem, who tortures him under the belief that Subaru works for someone against Amelia, since he possesses the scent of the Witch of Envy. Rem tells Subaru that she had despised him this entire time, with Subaru in utter disbelief. Subaru cries and yells, asking why she hates him so much as to take his life and still not believe his words. Ram casts her wind magic and sliced Subaru's neck, resulting in a sputtering of dense crimson fluid, thus marking Subaru's restart. Subaru awakens in his bedroom and immediately lunges to clench both Rem and Ram's hands to validate the feeling that he received when he was suffering. Responding negatively to this physical touch, Rem and Ram back off and accuse Subaru of partaking in masochism. Emilia enters the room and confirms Subaru's health. They trade good mornings, and Subaru resolves himself to fix the problems in his previous life and to save Rem's life. 
Ultimately, Subaru recognizes two main conditions he must fulfill in order to survive a full week in Roswell's mansion. Earn the trust of the staff, and defeat the shaman that attacks Roswell's mansion. Out of curiosity, Subaru asks Puck about the type of magic Amelia is prone to using, and questions him on whether or not Subaru could use magic himself. Puck asks Subaru whether or not he'd like to know his affinity, and tells Subaru that he possesses the rare Yin-type affinity, which Amelia comments is peculiarly rare. Puck then demonstrates to Subaru some basic Yin magic. After experiencing the atmosphere of Yin magic, Subaru suddenly chokes out of fear. Sweat precipitates down his face, but he fakes a facade of bravado. He works together with Puck to explore the gate of his mana, and attempts to manipulate mana with Puck's assistance. This reveals Subaru's gate ineffectiveness due to how little it's been used, says Puck. This results in a massive mushroom cloud of mana spreading around the area. Having expelled all of the mana in his body, Subaru reaches a state of fatigue where he can no longer move, which prompts him to react violently due to his fear of screwing up his life. He's fed a boko fruit by Amelia, which restores mana. The scene flashes to Roswell and Ram discussing Subaru's motives, and it reveals that they're more suspicious than they were in the first life in which they discussed Subaru's potential as a spy. Subaru later asks Beatrice how to counter a shaman's attack, to which Beatrice responds that it's impossible to counter a curse once it's activated and must be detected before it's activated. She notes the scent of the witch laid on Subaru, and Subaru questions the relationship between the witches and shaman. Beatrice delineates the witch with a description of her physical appearance and mental characteristics as a result, and emphasizes the Witch of Envy's similarity to Amelia. The next morning, Subaru wakes up with a burst of energy, and tells Amelia to offer up her lap, should the servant job become too weary on him. The speed at which he speaks is to be noted, as Subaru overworks himself. With how overexcited he is, Emilia and Puck begin to notice, with them commenting on Subaru's insides and outside being completely different. After knocking over a vase and replacing it, Rem notes the suspicious nature of Subaru's knowledge. Subaru is once again flustered in conversation and constantly feels sick of his behavior, with Rem and Emilia taking evident notice of Subaru's odd personality change. Subaru, feeling pressured by the efforts needed to make everything count in this life, eventually capsizes and Ralphs into a sink. With his physical appearance wearing out and his mental exhaustion reaching its peak, he squeezes as much as he can out of himself until Amelia encounters him. Amelia offers Subaru her lap as she comfortingly grasps hold of Subaru's head and beckons for him to lay on her lap. As he does so, Amelia offers consolation and discusses what he's been doing recently, recognizing his exhaustion and determination. Eventually, despite his joking facade, Subaru devolves into his real self once more, and releases a stream of emotion from his vocals, tearing up as he does so. With Emilia's recognition of his troubled mentality, Subaru releases his inner emotions and cleanses his mind, confirming Emilia's words. He cries and eventually falls asleep in Emilia's lap. Rem enters the room, looking for Subaru to assign more work to him. Rem decides to report to Ram that he can no longer work for the day. Just as Ram is about to leave, Emilia tells her that Subaru is a good person, which stirs a reaction in Ram's face as she leaves. At the closure of the episode, Subaru wakes up and recognizes what he had done. He circles Beatrice as he thinks about the situation. As he speaks with Beatrice, he confirms the nature of curses and learns more about them. Subaru learns that curses can only be placed through physical contact between the shaman and the target, which gives Subaru a lead in his goal in resolving the dilemma. Subaru visits the village with Ram and Rem with the purpose of finding the culprit when the puppy bites him again. When the three return from the village, Roswell leaves for the night, which didn't happen in the previous timelines. Subaru sees Beatrice, who confirms that he's cursed, and traces it to the dog that bit him. Subaru realizes that the children are in danger, and that night he returns to the village with Rem and finds that the children have gone missing. They venture into the forest and find all but one of the missing children, who have all been bitten by the puppy. While Rem heals the children, Subaru goes searching for the last child and gets attacked by a demon beast. Subaru defeats the demon beast, but a pack of them surround him, controlled by the demon puppy. Rem arrives and clears a path back towards the village, but the demon beast overwhelms Rem, who unleashes the demon within her and goes berserk. With Rem about to be killed, Subaru stands in to take the attack. This somehow doesn't kill Subaru, and he wakes up the next day having survived the attack with the timely arrival of Amelia and Rem. The barrier surrounding the village is restored to keep it safe from the demon beast. However, Subaru is afflicted by a large number of interwoven curses from the bites he received, and Beatrice is unable to lift them all before they take effect. Subaru is given a sword by the villagers, and he heads into the forest with Ram to kill the puppy controlling the demon beast, lift the curses on him, and find Ram. To his disappointment, Ram reveals to Subaru that she does not have a demon horn like Ram, and is less powerful. Subaru draws the demon beast by attempting to reveal the truth about his return by death. Subaru and Ram are chased and fall down a cliff where they're met by a pack of demon beasts and a berserk Ram. 
Using information provided by Ram, Subaru puts a plan into motion to hit Ram's horn so that she'll regain her senses. In the past, Ram and Ram lived in a demon village, where the birth of twins is considered taboo. Ram was a prodigy while Ram struggled with life. One day, Ram's horn was cut off by the witch cult and Ram has been blaming herself since. Back in the present, Ram regains her senses after Subaru knocked her unconscious. Subaru, Ram, and Ram run away from the demon beasts, but they encounter the puppy shaman behind the attack. So the twins can escape, Subaru stays put to fight the shaman, who is transformed into a fearsome beast. Subaru stabs the shaman with his broken sword, but the attack isn't effective. Just as Subaru is about to be killed, Roswall arrives to defeat the shaman and the remaining demon beasts, which also removes the curses on Subaru. Back at the mansion, Subaru wakes up with Rem in the room, and Subaru tells Rem to keep living for the future rather than to feel sorry for herself, causing her to fall in love with him. That night, Subaru again asks Amelia to go on a date with him to the village the next day, and she agrees. A flashback depicting Subaru as he overcame the invasion of the herd of Wolgarms is shown. In the present time, Subaru is dressed in a disguise in preparation to undertake in a secret mission where he can't be recognized by anyone. The mission entails Subaru's preliminary inspection of his date course with Amelia. However, the moment he steps foot into Irlam Village, the local children immediately recognize him and cling onto him playfully. Upon hearing about Subaru's date with Amelia, the village kids guide him to their secret place, a large field of flowers. At Roswell's mansion, Ram and Ram tend to the garden and notice that one of the flowers that recently bloomed is wilted. Roswell appears and notes the sad timing for it to occur. Inside the library, Beatrice notices a strange presence, as Amelia stands in front of a window that freezes up and cracks. Subaru awakens in his room from a bad dream and is astonished by Rem's presence. Rem's reason for being in Subaru's room was because she was restoring her energy by watching over him. Rem asks about his dream, to which he confesses that it was really a nightmare and refuses to talk about it, as it may come true if he does. As he gets out of bed, Subaru notices the temperature in the room is rather cold. Rem confirms that it is cold, most likely due to the weather, and compliments Subaru's astute insight, whereas he downplays it. In the mansion kitchen, Subaru peels potatoes and Rem tends to the cooking. As they work on their respective tasks, Subaru mentions that the cold weather is strange and asks about Rem's inadequate clothing. While Rem does have more appropriate clothing for the winter, she mentions that she and her sister are okay with the cold weather. On the subject of Rem's sister Rem, she apparently is sleeping in late due to the cold. This causes Subaru to snap as Ram's statement contradicts her prior one and goes off with Ram to give her a piece of his mind. As they do this, Ram forces Subaru to perform sweeping duty in one of the rooms as punishment for waking her from her sleep. This continues until Subaru finds a hatch on the floor, and when he opens it, finds an assortment of alcohol in it. Ram notes that Roswell's grandmother was a heavy drinker and that they could have belonged to her. Soon, Amelia arrives at the scene and is informed by a candid Ram that she's trying to convince Subaru to abstain from becoming an alcoholic. Hearing this, Amelia tries to convince Subaru as well, but Subaru goes on a tirade claiming that he isn't due to his age. This leads to Amelia revealing that the legal drinking age of the Kingdom of Lagunica is 15. The conversation continues, and both Subaru and Amelia's date is brought up. Hoping that the weather outside is better for their date tomorrow, Subaru notices that Amelia's clothing is rather light for the weather. She, however, feigns ignorance of the cold temperature and abruptly leaves, claiming that she has urgent business to attend to. Once Amelia is gone, Ram gives a snide remark, claiming that Amelia's urgent business wasn't urgent at all, and that Subaru is lower than her trivial stuff. On the contrary, Subaru vehemently denies it. That night, Subaru reviews the items he had prepared for the date the following day. He then gets into bed and tries to sleep, but is unable to. So, Subaru decides to count various things, including Puck, Amelia, and Roswell to help him sleep, but these don't work due to deja vus of his. It's then he notes the cold temperature in the room and hopes that the following day's weather is warmer. With that, Subaru finally falls asleep and dreams of a group of small angels with Roswell's head taking him out of bed. The following morning, Subaru awakes because of the frigid temperature. Outside of his room, Subaru runs into Beatrice, who declines to answer as to why she's awake so early in the morning. As Subaru talks about his date that day with Amelia, Beatrice walks away, claiming to not care about his business. This leads to a back and forth between the two, leading Subaru to be flung out a window. Later that day, Subaru performs mopping duties with Rem in the foyer area. They talk about how the date with Amelia was not cancelled, but postponed. A flashback reveals a fervent Amelia thankful for the postponement due to the cold weather. Reflecting on this, Subaru notes how Amelia's relieved-looking face bugged him. Rem then notes it was a wise choice for Subaru to cancel the date. This is because they may get stranded in a mountain because of the weather. Initially, Subaru agrees with this, but then gets an epiphany about how the two of them stranded in the mountains in a cabin would be a perfect romantic experience. However, Subaru downplays that scenario ever occurring as a snowstorm would never happen. 
It's then that Subaru breaks his mop from the now frozen bucket of water. The following day, Subaru awakens in his now frozen room. Afterward, he's served by Rem in the kitchen area. Soon, Roswall appears and notes the ineptness of how Subaru is unable to deal with the cold. As the conversation continues, Roswall reveals that the cold weather is only affecting the periphery of the mansion area. Furthermore, two people are currently investigating the problem of this odd occurrence. The three then head to Amelia's room, and when Subaru barges into Amelia's room, it's revealed that the source of the cold weather is Puck. A meeting is held in the dining room, and it's revealed the reason for the cold weather is because of Hatsumaki, which is a magical release period. Because Subaru is ignorant of the concept of Ode, Beatrice elucidates the subject to him. When he asked about the sudden surge in cold weather, Puck answers that it was due to the fact that he figured he could get away with upping his magical exertion. After formally apologizing to Subaru, Amelia asks Puck how much longer this cold weather will last. Puck answers it'll be another two days before it ends. Amelia also reveals that due to having a contract with Puck, she's immune to the cold temperature. It's then that Subaru has an epiphany to solve their cold problem, and it's that they should simply go outside. However, this idea is squelched due to the downpour of rain. Subaru then gets another idea for them to camp outside, but this is shot down by Roswell for not wanting to sleep outside. Another idea Subaru gets is heating up the mansion with a giant fireball, but Roswell claims that would just set the mansion on fire. Finally, Subaru believes they should just spend the next two days in the bathing area and enjoy a nice hot bath. This too is impossible, as the bathtub is completely filled with mayonnaise. This was because Subaru wanted to bathe in it. Back in the dining room, Subaru and Ram huddle by the fireplace. When Roswell and Beatrice are asked about how they deal with their surplus of Ode, they reveal their respective ways. It's also revealed that Rem doesn't have enough magical energy they need to do a Hatsumaki, and Amelia can simply maintain hers quite easily because of Puck. Subaru then asks, when was the last time Puck used his energy to his heart's content? Puck reveals it was when they faced a certain black-haired woman that they fought back in the capital. Another time was when Puck faced off against Roswell, and the two joyfully reminisce on that fight they had with each other. Sometime afterwards, Subaru, Rem, and Amelia collect firewood. Subaru has another epiphany, one inspired by his hometown of Hokkaido, to help squander Puck's abundance of Ode. The plan is called Roswell's Mansion Cheeky Cheeky Snow Festival First Edition. The next day, Subaru speaks in a sports commentator-like fashion to the people of Irlam Village in front of Roswell's mansion. He then explains the rules of the game, that being the person who builds the best snow sculpture will win a prize. After Subaru's explanation of the rules, the villagers begin sculpting their snow sculptures. Looking around, Subaru notices that Beatrice is missing and finds her in the library. It's thanks to her barrier that the snow didn't spread any farther to the village. Trying to convince Beatrice to join in on the fun outside, she refuses and wishes to be alone. Noting Beatrice's stubbornness, Subaru places a small head of a snowman on top of her head, which causes her to fling him out the window. Outside, the village kids throw snowballs at Subaru, and Puck dumps a pile of snow on top of him. Petra then approaches Subaru and shows him the snow rabbit she made. Impressed by the design, Subaru adds a couple of things to touch it up, making it look more impressive. Happy with how it looks now, Subaru upgrades it and is reprimanded by Petra for it. Beatrice witnesses the scene play out and disparages Subaru. She's then joined by Puck, who comments that Subaru would have wanted to play with him down there. Meanwhile, as Amelia diligently sculpts her snow sculpture, she's joined by Beatrice, who starts to sculpt her own sculpture. She claims that it's Puck who convinced her to do so. Elsewhere, Puck and Subaru browse the snow sculptures, and one of them, a sculpture of a Wolgrim, catches his eye. Back to Amelia, who finishes her sculpture and stops Beatrice from cheating by using magic to sculpt hers. Back to Puck and Subaru, the spirit asks Subaru who the judges are. He answers that they're him, Roswell, and Muraosa as a mystery judge. The two then stop at Ram and Ram's snow sculpture that's hidden behind a curtain. Ram and Ram's snow sculpture is named the wonderful Subwal Sama sculpture, and it's revealed to be an amalgam of both Roswell and Subaru. Roswell himself shows up, and when he sees the sculpture is despondent, and the low ratings given by the two judges flabbergasts the twin sisters. Emilia then approaches Roswell and Subaru. She asks them to see her and Beatrice's snow sculptures. However, Subaru is pulled away by the village kids so that they can show him their sculpture. It's a sculpture of Subaru, and while he's impressed, the kids try to touch it up, but in the process, knock off the sculpture's head. That's definitely not foreshadowing at all. In the end, Emilia's sculpture gets a 9, which upsets her, more so Beatrice, who got a 7. Both of their sculptures were a depiction of Puck. The winner of the snow sculpture contest is revealed to be Petra's of her robot bunny, and the prize was a bag of corn chips. From one of the mansion's balconies, Subaru calls over Puck and Amelia as the banquet will soon begin. In the dining hall, Subaru thanks everyone for their hard work that day and hopes to hold the festival again when Puck has another Hatsumaki. With that settled, the banquet begins and everyone enjoys themselves on the various food and alcoholic beverages served. During the banquet, Amelia and Rem both get drunk and tease Subaru until they individually fall asleep on his lap. 
Seeing Beatrice by her lonesome outside on the balcony, Subaru decides to join her. He offers her a cup of apple juice, whereas Beatrice retorts that she's the second oldest one there after Puck. Subaru, on the other hand, doesn't pay attention to that last comment as he's more transfixed on Amelia and Rem embracing one another. To make up for his impertinence, Subaru divulges to Beatrice the star constellations and reveals that he was named after one. The reception of this revelation is tepid at most. Just then, the entire mansion area lights up due to the gathering of the snow spirits. To use up his remaining mana, Puck decides to make it snow all the way to the capital. The next morning, the snow around the mansion starts to melt. As Amelia prepares herself for her date with Subaru, she and Puck talk about how they should have been more transparent in the first place about Puck's Hatsumaki. An anxious Subaru waits outside the mansion until Amelia finally arrives and the two finally go on their date with each other. One week after the Demon Beast incident, Subaru and Amelia come back from a morning outing with the village kids. After returning to the mansion, Amelia is summoned to the capital and the two are escorted by Wilhelm and Felix, also known as Ferris. At the capital, Subaru sees the fruit merchant and buys a bag of apples. They then meet Julius and the sight of him chivalrously kissing Amelia's hand causes a jealous reaction by Subaru. Subaru then witnesses a red-headed young woman, Priscilla, being chased by the same three hoodlums who killed him in previous timelines. He goes into the alley to save her, but the hoodlums run away when Old Man Rom appears looking for Felt, whom Subaru says was taken away by Reinhard. Later, Amelia insists Subaru does not accompany her to the castle where the candidates for the upcoming royal election will gather. However, the next day, Subaru breaks his promise and accepts a ride to the castle in Priscilla's carriage as her apple servant. At the castle, Amelia is shocked to see Subaru with Priscilla, who calls Subaru her manservant. As Amelia, Priscilla, Anastasia, and Krush wait, to everyone's surprise, Reinhardt introduces Felt as the fifth and final candidate. The nobles are surprised to hear that Felt is from the slums, which causes tension between them and the Imperial Knights. Felt declares that she won't enter the royal election and picks a fight with the other candidates. When Amelia is criticized for being a half-elf, Subaru declares that he is Amelia's knight, accidentally insulting the Knights of Lagunica and offending Julius. Old Man Rom breaks into the throne room to take Felt away, though he's easily caught. In a desperate attempt to save him, Felt agrees to enter the royal election and declares that she'll destroy the current nation when she wins. Afterward, Julius challenges Subaru to a duel with wooden swords because of his insult to the Imperial Knights and viciously beats up Subaru in a very one-sided battle. When Subaru wakes up, because of course he was knocked out, Emilia tells him to stay in the capital to recover as she and Roswell return to the mansion. When Subaru refuses, Emilia asks him his reasons for going so far to help her, but Subaru is unable to tell her about his ability nor what happened in the first timeline. Emilia then accuses Subaru of trying to help himself under the guise of helping her, believing herself to be unworthy of happiness because she's a half-elf. This results in Subaru losing his sanity, verbally attacking Emilia with his experiences in the other timelines and claiming that Emilia owes him far more than he ever owed her. Unable to understand each other, nor able to trust Subaru anymore, Emilia decides to end their friendship. Three days after the royal candidate selection, Subaru and Rem stay at Karsten Mansion to recuperate and for the former's treatment. Frustrated at his weakness, Subaru trains obsessively with Wilhelm van Estrella, but shows little improvement. Reinhard comes to apologize to Subaru and asks him to reconcile with Julius, but Subaru refuses. Subaru and Rem go to town and meet Kataman the vendor, who says that people won't support Emilia for the royal election because of her link to the Witch of Envy. At night, over drinks, Krush tells him to be more positive, and Ferris says that he should find a way to make up with Amelia. Rem tells them through her connection with Ram that something is occurring back at Mather's domain. Subaru and Rem decide to return to Roswell's mansion, but while staying at a hotel, Rem leaves during the night to help on her own in the hopes of protecting Subaru. Upon learning this, Subaru hires a car driver named Otto to take him to the mansion, but at nightfall, Otto's ground dragon refuses to continue. Subaru walks on alone and meets a group of dark-robed and hooded humans who encircle Subaru before disappearing. At dawn, he reaches the village and finds dead bodies everywhere, and when he reaches the mansion, he's distraught to see Rem's body. Subaru enters the mansion to find it littered with bodies just like the village, including Rem and the children he once saved, and eventually discovers an icy room where he freezes to death. He resets with a new timeline back at the vendor's stall again where he hugs Rem and goes catatonic. Krush and Ferris can heal him physically, but unfortunately can't help his mental state. Rem and Subaru head home, but their cart is ambushed by the witch cult, and while Rem fights them, one escapes with the unconscious Subaru. Subaru finds himself chained up and meets their leader, the maniacal Petaljuice Romane Conti. Rem finds the meeting place and attempts to destroy Petaljuice and his men, but to no avail. Rem is tortured and then left in a mess, with both arms and legs mangled and broken. Petaljuice leaves Subaru to die. However, Rem, with what little life she has, uses magic to cut the chains and tells Subaru to live, confessing her love to him before passing away. 
Subaru carries Rem's body to the mansion, seeing piles of bodies along the way. He finally arrives at the mansion, only to find a dead Ram before a monstrous puck who appears outside the mansion and tells Subaru to sleep along with his daughter and decapitates him. Subaru then respawns by the vendor stall again and curses Petaljuice. The next episode begins with Subaru and Rem returning to Krusha's mansion holding hands. There, they meet a man named Russell Fellow, who belongs to a merchant guild. He welcomes Subaru, but no conversation takes place. After Russell leaves, Subaru asks Wilhelm for a favor. Apparently, the favor was addressed to Krush, as the next scene pictures him, Rem, Ferris, Wilhelm, and Krush in the same room, with Subaru preparing himself to request Krush's aid. He asks for her help to deal with the witch's cult, stating that they'll attack Roswell's domain in three days. Krush is suspicious at first and thinks that Subaru is a member of the cult. He denies, and Rem assures her that his intentions aren't malicious. Leaving this detail aside, Krush focuses on her possible gains. Subaru can't think of anything else other than his own eternal gratitude, so Krush makes a deal. If she helps him save the people in the domain, Emilia is to withdraw from the royal competition. He refuses initially, but he sees no other option, so he accepts. Thinking that they have a deal, Subaru is surprised to hear that Krush won't actually help him, as she would have no gain by doing so. Emilia stands no chance anyway, since the people don't like her or the thought of a half-elf ruling over them. Subaru loses his cool and becomes aggressive towards Krush, revealing his true intent, killing every single member of the witch cult. Krush then tells him that she saw his thoughts, stating, You haven't even once said you want to save Amelia. The negotiation ends with her telling Subaru that he has a pig's desire, hence the title of the episode. Subaru leaves angry, with Rem following him. That is, not before Rem respectfully thanks Krush, Wilhelm, and Ferris for their care. That night, the two of them are shown in a room of some inn, thinking of a strategy for gaining support, but all their possibilities fall one by one. Therefore, they decide to think about something the next day. The following morning, Subaru tells Rem to go ask the knights for help, while he would go and ask the other competitors. He's next shown at Priscilla's place, asking for help. She's apparently surprised by his demand at first, but goes with the flow. With no true intentions for her sole entertainment, she has one condition that, if completed, might change her thoughts. Subaru has to lick Priscilla's foot. He hesitates while Priscilla asks him if he values his pride more than his wishes. In the end, he decides to lick her foot. When he almost completes the request, Priscilla hits him in the face with that foot, then beats him, showing her disgust. She gets angry, for he has no loyalty to nothing but his own goals, as she explained. Subaru is then led out by Al at Priscilla's orders. Al acts nice and leads him to the gate peacefully, but they don't chat about what happened, except for Al expressing his surprise regarding his master's reaction. Not knowing where else to go for help, Subaru is shown wandering the streets of the capital. There, an unexpected meeting occurs. Anastasia shows up, followed by Mimi. They go to a pub and chat, but things turn out bad for Subaru. He was being used by Anastasia to find out about her rival, Krush. She only threw out bait to find out, from Subaru's reactions and mimics, details about Krush's current state and preparations. Finding this out, Subaru angers and tries to get close to Anastasia, but is stopped by Mimi, her second-in-command. Subaru is told by the contestant that he doesn't know how to negotiate. He should show the other party gains from the contract, not only his personal reasons. Anastasia then leaves, followed by Mimi and the rest of her guards, who seem to have been drinking along with them in the pub. Subaru is left alone, angry, and with his only gain being a note from Anastasia that would assure him a dragon carriage. His reunion with Rem takes place, and he finds out that she wasn't successful either. The knights keep receiving such tips, so they don't take them seriously anymore. So they decide to leave that instant, get there as fast as possible, and take Amelia and the others away from there. On the road to Roswell's mansion, they meet Otto and a caravan of merchants camping for the night. Otto has brought oil that's out of date, so Subaru takes advantage of the fact and buys all the oil along with a service. Otto will wait till morning, but leave with them to the domain that instant. The same offer goes to the other merchants, as their carriages would be handy for carrying the people in the village. The deal is made and they leave immediately, however, after reaching Flugel's tree, the Hakuge shows up along its mist. Being under the attack of the Hakuge, the remaining merchants, along with Subaru, Rem, and Otto, start to run for their lives, aware that they stand no chance against such an opponent. Seeing no way out of this situation, though, Rem left the money in Subaru's care and temporarily paralyzes him with a hit to his throat. Unable to move, he couldn't stop her from going to fight the whale, and his consciousness slowly fades as he sees her leaving for his sake. Regaining consciousness, he found himself still in Otto's carriage, trying to get out of the mist. Subaru yelled at Otto for abandoning Rem, but while they're arguing, Otto suddenly forgets who Rem is. The whale attacked them from behind, but they managed to get some time and distance and surpass it again. Otto panicked and kept wondering why, out of all the merchants in the mist, the Hakuge keeps following them. Subaru then realizes it's a demon beast and therefore must be attracted by him. Hearing this, Otto throws Subaru off the carriage with no hesitation. 
Seeing himself left alone and threatened by the whale, Subaru can only think of running, but his current condition won't allow him to do his best. He gained advantage due to the whale's howl, with him being blown away. After getting up, he somehow managed to escape the Hakuge's pursuit. He searched the surroundings for a trace of it, but instead sees Otto's carriage approaching. When about to get on, Subaru noticed that Otto is missing. He asks the dragon about him, but receives an answer only when noticing the witch's cult daggers and some spilled blood inside the carriage. Saddened, he hops in and tells the dragon to go forward to the village. It's only in the morning that they arrive and are greeted by the village's children. Relieved that they're still alive, Subaru collapses unconscious in front of them. Subaru woke up to find himself at the Roswell Mansion, with Ram standing at his side, who he mistook for Ram. When he jumps at her out of happiness and relief, she told him that his gesture can be considered indecent, the moment when he realized it was Ram's sister and not Ram herself. Subaru then asks who healed him. After hearing that it was Amelia, he felt overwhelmed by guilt. Subaru left to go see Amelia and tried to force her out of the place, but his despair didn't allow him to explain anything. Therefore, Amelia refused to cooperate, causing Subaru to feel obligated to tell her the truth. While he gathers his courage in words, she was confused about his behavior and asked him why he was crying. He decided to put his life at stake and tell her about his ability, not caring what was to happen anymore. But while he began to tell her what was happening, time starts to slow down, only this time it doesn't seem to cause him that much pain. Seeing this, Subaru revealed to Amelia his ability to travel back from death. However, he was shocked to discover that Amelia had been killed by the same presence in his stead. Beatrice made an appearance in the room, and Subaru, in his despair and pain, begged for her to kill him. She said that she's had enough pain and sorrow, so she sent him away along with Amelia's body, saying that if he wanted to die, he should do it away from her sight. Subaru found himself in the middle of a forest, still holding Amelia in his arms. In his agony, he yelled for somebody to kill him, and then some members of the witch cult appear, led by Petaljuice. The latter tried to hit him with his unseen hand, but Subaru dodges just in time. This made Petaljuice angry, for there's no person who should be able to see the unseen hand given from the Witch of Envy. Before he can continue, his attacks are stopped, though, by none other than a very enraged Puck, who came to rescue Amelia, whom Puck referred to as his daughter. Upon Puck's arrival, the spirit issued a proclamation of death before raining down a barrage of icicles onto the members of the Witch Cult. Seeing this sight, Subaru called out Puck's name, but the spirit merely told him to shut up. At that moment, Petaljuice attempted to crush Puck with his unseen hands. Thinking he was successful, the madman mocked the spirit's sloth for not killing him immediately. However, Puck easily breaks free from the restraints, unleashing his true form in the process as a harsh blizzard engulfed the surroundings. Now towering over the both of them, Puck declared that Petaljuice would need at least a thousand shadows to kill him, half of what Satella could achieve. As he began to freeze and shatter Petaljuice's body, the madman proclaimed his faith to the Witch of Envy and how he eagerly looked forward to their reunion. Now turning his attention to Subaru, Puck mentioned to him that he had committed three sins. The first was breaking his promise with Amelia, the second was returning to the mansion against her wishes, and the third was that he killed her. Continuing on, Puck informed Subaru that he would destroy the world as stated in their contract, adding that Amelia was his entire reason for existing. Noticing that the fog was drawing closer, Puck stated that the Hakuge was approaching. As Subaru began to die from being frozen bit by bit, he began to hear the mad laughter of a man he hated before realizing it was coming from himself. As Subaru died lamenting his failures, Puck declared that he had been slothful. Returning in front of Kataman's store for the third time, Subaru pulled Ram aside as he continued running. After cooling down a bit, Subaru apologized for his previous behavior, stating that he was feeling stressed so he skipped out on explaining. After saying that he had been bothering a lot of people with his contemplation and agony, Subaru remarked he had finally found the solution to finally take care of everything. Reaching out his hand, he asked Rem to run away with him. As Subaru listed the possible travel locations, Rem asked if it was part of another great plan to help Roswell and Amelia. However, Subaru shot down the question, bitterly remarking that he was helpless in the capital and even more powerless if he returned to the mansion. He fell into a self-loathing spiral about why he should disappear. Already having enough failures and death, Subaru asked Rem to run away with him and start a new life together in Kawaragi. However, Rem refused the request, saying that they should be happy when talking about their future. Rem then gave a speech regarding how they would live their ideal lives together in Kawaragi, from the time of their arrival, settling down into jobs, having kids, and eventually her passing on before him. Hearing this, Subaru asked why she would still refuse if she's describing this life in such happy detail. Rem replied back that leaving now would mean abandoning the traits of him that she loved most. After hearing that it was easy to give up, Subaru shouted back that it was much easier to think that he could achieve something. With no way out and nothing he could do, giving up was the only path left for him. Rem replied back that giving up wouldn't suit him because he isn't someone who would stop halfway through. 
Hearing this, Subaru replied that she was wrong, and goes on a rant about how he hates himself for wanting everything while lacking strength, dreaming while lacking knowledge, and struggling in futility as his only option. Continuing on, Subaru yells that she knows nothing about him before he came here. Despite having endless freedom and time, he did nothing, and what he is now was the result of that. Listening on, Rem listed the reasons why she loves him. From the way he brushed her hair, held her hand, and walked together, she gently continued the daily things about him that she adored. As Subaru asked why, Rem told him that listening to him say that he hated himself made her want to tell him all the wonderful things she knows about him. Subaru retorted back that his behavior was phony, as he knows himself best. Finally, raising her voice, Rem retorted tearfully that if all he understood was himself, then he knows nothing about how she views him. To her, he's a hero who saved her by saying the words that melted her frozen heart and allowed her to move on from her past. With the acknowledgement that someone else believes in him and willing to support him, Subaru slowly regained his resolve. In the process, Subaru confessed that he loves Amelia, with his goal being able to see her smile. Rem joked that it was cruel of him to ask this from a girl he just rejected. Nevertheless, Subaru regained the determination to reface his problems in helping Amelia, essentially starting his story from a new beginning. From Zero. Hey, that's, that's like the title of the show! After he returned from death, Subaru changes his approach, deciding to defeat the White Whale before going after the Witch Cult. Knowing when the White Whale will strike from his previous loop, Subaru offers Crucia's camp an alliance to battle the White Whale in exchange for shared mining rights of magic stones in Roswell's domain. She agrees when Subaru uses his cell phone to show the time and location of the attack and offers to draw the whale towards himself. Anastasia agrees to join the campaign, viewing the whale's presence as detrimental to her interests as well. Krush is impressed by his skill in gathering support, and Wilhelm lets Subaru know that his wife, Theresia, the Sword Saint, was killed by the White Whale, created by the Witch of Envy, and has devoted his life to defeating it. The next day, before setting off to fight against the White Whale, Subaru and Rem decide to buy an Earth Dragon from Krush's domain. He encountered a familiar black dragon, the same earth dragon that Ferris and Wilhelm rode to Roswell's manor. After they bought the earth dragon, Subaru met a large wolf-like demi-human named Ricardo Welkin, captain of Anastasia's mercenary group, the Fang of Iron. Subaru and Rem, riding an earth dragon called Patrash, along with Krusha's army and Anastasia's Fang of Iron, head out to the Flugel Tree to wait for the whale to appear. Along the way, he met with two of the Fang of Iron's members, Mimi Pearlbatten and her brother, Hitaro Pearlbatten. Subaru noted that he didn't expect to see her again, but Mimi couldn't recall the time she met Subaru as he had only met her in his previous loop. At the same time, Ricardo approaches Subaru and Rem as he gives compliments about Subaru's Earth Dragon. Subaru asks him about the large wolves they're riding. Ricardo answers the question by saying they're called Ligers. He also mentioned that he's also prepared for something other than the White Whale. After they'd finished their conversation, Ricardo approaches the other soldiers to ease off their worries before the fight. That night, the whale appears the moment Subaru said it would, and the battle begins. The battle with the white whale begins with the Night Banisher fired to temporarily change the appearance of the nighttime sky to daytime. Subaru and Rem draw the whale towards them with the Crucian Anastasia armies attacking the whale, and Wilhelm slashing the whale at close range, hoping to ground it. However, the whale is still floating in the sky after these attacks, and it unleashes a fog from glands on its skin. Subaru and Rem evade a fog blast, which Subaru realizes erases a person's existence, calling it a fog of elimination. The armies begin to lose soldiers, and Subaru yells out his return by death to draw the whale towards him and away from the injured soldiers. Wilhelm and Ricardo's unit follow Subaru and relentlessly attack the whale, but they suffer setbacks as Wilhelm gets swallowed by it and Ricardo is badly injured. As the fog clears, three whales are seen floating in the sky. The armies become demoralized with the appearance of three whales. While running with Krush and watching the armies battle two whales who attack them, Subaru notices the difference in fighting strength and the gouged left eye in all whales. This leads him to conclude that two of the whales are doppelgangers of the third that is keeping its distance from the armies and that they need to defeat that one. To draw the whale to the ground, Rem launches Subaru on an ice shard towards the whale. Subaru taunts it and then falls toward the ground, using his smell of the witch to draw closer to him in the flugel tree. Rem catches Subaru, and the armies use magic and explosives to cut through the base of the tree, felling it onto the passing whale. Immobilized by the tree, Wilhelm slashes away wildly at the whale, killing it and avenging Theresia's death, and causing the other two to vanish. With the whale defeated, Subaru turns his attention to his original objective of saving Amelia and the villagers from the witch cult. In recognition of his courage, the Crucian Anastasia camps provide some soldiers and knights for Subaru to destroy the cult. That includes Wilhelm, Ricardo, Ferris, and two of the Pearlbatten siblings, Mimi and Tivi, while the injured and weak, including Krush, Rem, and Hitaro, travel back. 
A group of Anastasia's mercenaries provide further reinforcements, only for Subaru to learn that Julius is among them. After trading insults with Julius, Subaru reconciles with him somewhat. Subaru's attack on the witch's cult begins by approaching Petaljuice using his smell of the witch, which makes Petaljuice believe that Subaru is the Archbishop of Pride. When Petaljuice realizes that Subaru doesn't have the gospel he should have received as an archbishop and says that he defiled it, Petaljuice completely loses his composure. With his guard down, Mimi and Tivi launch a surprise attack to destroy the hideout, and Wilhelm kills Petaljuice while the rest of his band go after Petaljuice's fingers. However, Petaljuice's soul is still present in one of the fingers who attacks, using unseen hands to kill some of the band and capture Subaru. Fortunately, the finger is distracted by a tiny spirit, and Wilhelm kills her and rescues Subaru. Subaru is upset at his critical mistake, which allowed soldiers to die, but Wilhelm tells him to keep fighting. As Subaru and his band of soldiers ride to evacuate people from the mansion in the village, Ferris tells Subaru to make up with Julius. As Subaru approaches Julius, he finds himself suddenly alone on the road, enveloped in a blue mist, and Rem mysteriously appears on a cliff above holding a bright blue flower. Subaru is enveloped in the blue mist and attacked by plants, but is saved by the illusion of the same tiny spirit called La that Julius had set onto Subaru to protect him. After Julius frees the rest of the soldiers and merchants from the encampment, Subaru is attacked by Ram, who thinks that he abandoned Amelia. When the misunderstanding is cleared up, Subaru tries to begin the evacuation of the villagers. They mistrust him and Amelia, but Ram intervenes and convinces them to leave. During the evacuation, Ferris discovers that a merchant is part of the witch's cult, and he self-destructs, knocking out Subaru. When Subaru wakes up, he realizes that the village is under attack by the witch's cult, and that the Archbishop of Sloth's power can be transferred to other fingers who are among the merchants. When confronting the final finger, Emilia shows up and defeats him. After the battle, when La suddenly abandons Subaru, he panics and runs into the forest. Ferris and Julius chase after him, but Subaru's body becomes possessed by petal juice. Subaru fights back long enough to ask Ferris and Julius to kill him. They reluctantly agree, and as Julius is about to cut him down, the scene shifts to Amelia in the village. With Subaru's death, he surprisingly resets back to the strategy meeting on the morning after the White Whale battle. Now aware that the cult can possess others, he formulates a new strategy to take out the fingers first before going after Petaljuice himself. Wilhelm drops by the mansion to clear up the misunderstanding from the letter and to order the evacuation of the village. Then Subaru, wearing a cloak to mask his presence, arrives to tell Amelia that an attack is imminent and convince her to follow through with the evacuation. Knowing that there are spies among the merchants, Subaru hands out the plan of evacuation that is two hours behind schedule, and the spy is apprehended. Subaru approaches Petaljuice at his hideout, offering to go through the ordeal to join the cult and become a new vessel. When Subaru is asked to show his gospel, he shows the meteor he took from the spy to commence the surprise attack. Subaru runs, with Petaljuice and the remaining fingers in pursuit. Mimi and Tivi arrive to attack the fingers, and Subaru draws Petaljuice towards the bottom of the cliff, which he jumped off in a past timeline. Julius arrives and attacks Petaljuice, helped out by Subaru's ability to see the unseen hands. With his senses connected to Subaru's, Julius is now able to cut down Petaljuice's unseen hands with his swordsmanship. Furious that his devotion was being belittled by tricks, Petaljuice began summoning more and more hands to know that his fingers had been killed. In the process, he managed to injure Julius's legs, stomach, and shoulder. As the battle was occurring, Emilia is in the dragon carriage with the children. Wilhelm had a brief discussion with her, where in the end she offered her assistance. He warmly rejects the offer and tells Emilia to not let go of the children's hands before saying that they were truly master and servant. As Emilia questioned him on this, she found out that Wilhelm had already left. Returning back to the fight, Subaru starts feeling the pain from Julius's wounds and bemews that they might be crazy to entrust their lives on such an outlandish tactic. Julius merely responded that he was starting to get accustomed to the feeling, and told Subaru that he would be raising his speed. Using Al, Julius eliminated the unseen hands as he made his way to Petaljuice. In response, the Archbishop of Sloth was forced to use earth magic to summon up a shield. However, Subaru threw a magical stone to ignite past the defense, allowing Julius to stab Petaljuice in the stomach. Julius remarked that his downfall came from viewing Subaru simply as weak. Once again, Petaljuice tried to possess Subaru's body. Feeling this happen, Subaru quickly told Julius to undo Necht. This time, Subaru tried to reveal his Return by Death ability, which took both of them to a shadowy place. At first, Petaljuice was ecstatic over being able to meet the Witch of Envy. However, the Witch of Envy, under the appearance of a dark silhouette, kicked Petaljuice out of Subaru's body. Returning to his original body, Petaljuice couldn't understand why the Witch rejected him, and began retreating to the rock face to escape from Julius. Not having any energy left, he let out one last unseen hand that eventually destroyed the rock face above him, causing the rocks to fall down onto him and crush him to death. Confirming he was dead, Subaru told Petaljuice that he had been slothful. 
Afterwards, Subaru picked up and briefly flipped through Petaljuice's gospel before Julius told him they should head back to the village since Ferris had contacted them. They informed Subaru that the magic stones in the merchant's inventory were gone and someone had likely loaded it into Ketty's carriage, which was currently being used to transport Amelia and the children. Otto added that the amount of explosives is enough to blow away a small village. Hearing this, Subaru takes Otto's offer to transport him on the fastest route to the dragon carriages without hesitating. Julius, who was still injured from the fight with Petaljuice, lent carriages as fast as possible. Lent them his fire spirit, La, to detect the fire magic stones. Chasing after the merchant's dragon carriages as fast as possible, Subaru spotted Petaljuice pursuing them using his unseen hands to forcibly move his dead body, intent on claiming Subaru's body once again. Not having any other way of fighting back, Subaru threw a pot of Otto's oil at the madman, then used La's power to set it on fire, creating an explosion that hit him straight on. Still, Petaljuice refused to yield and continued to cling onto the carriage while demanding Subaru return the witch's love to him. As a result, Subaru threw Petaljuice's gospel book, causing him to use an unseen hand to catch it and was subsequently hit by powerful wind resistance that forced him to fall back. Subaru followed up by delivering a punch straight through his face, knocking Petaljuice off the dragon carriage. However, a portion of his robe was stuck to the carriage, causing Petaljuice's body to be dragged along the ground as the friction began to break his body apart. Nonetheless, he still refused to give up, prompting Subaru to write THE END underneath the last entry in the gospel book in his own blood, and that moment, Petaljuice's robe ripped free from the carriage. Unfortunately for him, his robe got tangled up in the carriage's wheel, dragging him underneath the carriage where he was crushed to death for the second time, this time for good. As Subaru and Otto continued towards Amelia's carriage, Wilhelm and the others were busy facing off against the leftover members of the witch cult. Wilhelm instructed Subaru to head towards the Great Tree. In the meantime, the kids accidentally let it slip that they had to take care of Amelia for Subaru's sake. Hearing this shocked Amelia, who wondered why Subaru would go so far to save her after all the pain and suffering that he underwent. At that moment, Subaru arrived at the carriage and grabbed the bag of firestones hidden within the carriage. Amelia questioned why he was there, but Subaru merely replied that he loved her, much to her shock. Racing on top of Patrash with the bag of explosives in tow, Subaru quickly arrived at the dead carcass of the Hakuge. There, he threw the bag with all of his might so that the explosion could detonate at a safe distance from the others, getting caught up in the blast as Patrash shields him. When he later woke up, Subaru found himself laying on Amelia's lap. Subaru commented that he felt like he had a long dream. Subaru apologized for his actions back then, saying that he was only thinking of himself. However, he reconfirmed that the only thing he wasn't wrong about was his desire to save her, once again confessing his love for Amelia. She replied that she was a half-elf and a self-motive for becoming king. Still, Subaru said that he would continue to love and support her despite what anyone else said about her. Overjoyed upon hearing this, Amelia said that this was the first time she had received special treatment that made her happy and tearfully thanked Subaru for saving her. Back in the carriage while traveling back, Subaru mentions to Amelia that Rem said some stuff to him and asks about her whereabouts. Amelia just looks at him confused and asks him, Who's Rem? The Everlasting Contract Three days after the battle against the Witch Cult, Subaru and Amelia head back to the village from the Karsten Mansion in the last of the six dragon carriages prepared for the villagers, though he didn't take the children with him as he wanted to talk to her in private. In addition, they were also taking back Rem's unconscious body, which already had its name and memories eaten by Lai, Bait, and Katos. Before he left for Roswall's mansion, he was approached by an amnesiac Krush, along with Ferris and Wilhelm, to bid them farewell. Ferris was somewhat concerned about Subaru, who had overused his already damaged gate during the battle. Nonetheless, he didn't feel any different, yet was ordered not to use magic for two months. Emilia asked Krush if she was concerned that she was a silver-haired half-elf, but Krush, after hearing from Emilia that she wasn't embarrassed about how she was living her life, told her that she wasn't afraid of her in the slightest. On the way to Roswell's land, the mood inside of the dragon carriage was terrible, prompting Otto to try to lighten it up. However, he was shocked when Subaru forgot he was there since he was driving. Still, he did manage to lighten up the mood after a brief conversation, after which he was shut out from the carriage. Following a bit of trivial talk, the conversation shifted to business, at which point Otto rejoined the conversation. Once they reached the village, they were surprised to see that it was empty, with no sign of the villagers that had evacuated to the sanctuary, leading them to believe that something was happening there. Subaru and Amelia decide to return to the mansion along with Otto since they didn't know where the sanctuary was, and to Subaru's surprise, the inside of the mansion was clean, as he had expected it to be trashed. Suddenly, a shadow approached him from behind, and upon seeing a mouth filled with white beast-like fangs, he lost consciousness. He woke up later, receiving an apology from Frederica soon after, and moved on to the topic at hand. Frederica revealed that she had been called back by Ram to work on the mansion, as she didn't have the skills to do it herself. 
After thinking about what happened to Rem during the battle, he had Amelia insult him to clear his mind, then left for the library to visit Beatrice. Upon arriving at the library, he asked her if she remembered Rem, however, she refused to answer, pointing out that the question was inquiring about someone eaten by gluttony. Hearing this, he tried to get information about that from her, though she still refused to say anything about it. She was surprised to see that he had Petaljuice's gospel book, prompting him to tell her that he killed Petaljuice, causing her to ask about the sloth witch factors. Seeing that he didn't understand her words, she wondered why Subaru killed him, telling him that he would have to come to a decision about the witch factors sometime in the future. She then informed him that she wasn't this convenient tool for answers before kicking him out of the library. Returning from the library, he went to the dragon carriage with Frederica to take Rem to her room, learning on the way to her room that Beatrice was a spirit. After setting Rem down on the bed, he discussed the situation with Amelia, who decided that they needed to go to the sanctuary. Having heard her plan, Frederica agreed to prepare for that trip, informing them that it would be two days later, and warned them to be careful of Garfield Tinsel while they were there. During the wait, Subaru attempted to talk Otto into joining Amelia's camp, which he succeeded in doing, but as a precaution, had Petra act as a witness. Two days later, Subaru, Amelia, and Otto left for the sanctuary, leaving Frederica and Petra behind to take care of the mansion. As they entered the forest near the sanctuary, Amelia lost consciousness, and they were subsequently attacked by Garfield. Garfield easily defeated both their Earth Dragon and Otto, however he decided to let Subaru through after seeing him protect Amelia no matter what happened, offering to guide all of them into the village. Once they arrived at the village, they met Ram, who guided them into the house where Roswell was. To their surprise, Roswell was lying down on his bed, his body heavily injured. Questioning the injured man, Roswell confirmed that the sanctuary was also known as the Witch of Greed's Graveyard, who he insisted the others refer to by name as Echidna. Continuing on, he revealed that the Roswalls were in charge of taking care of the graveyard, along with the fact that he and the villagers were under house arrest, which is why they were unable to return. Noticing that Subaru was misunderstanding the situation, he explained that he wasn't injured to be placed under house arrest, rather he was injured so he was placed under house arrest, if that makes sense adding that the villagers weren't directly responsible for his injuries. Soon after, Garfield arrived, who became angry at Roswell for not properly explaining things, prompting Roswell to ask him to guide Subaru and Amelia to the graveyard, and as they left, Ram quietly warned Subaru to not enter the graveyard if he didn't want to be captivated by the thoughts of the witch. Fifteen minutes later, they arrived, prompting Garfield to ask Amelia to enter to check whether she was worthy of taking the trials or not. The two are confused by his request, leading him to reveal that he didn't know much about the trials himself, only that those who are worthy of taking them were unable to leave the sanctuary until they cleared them. Hearing this, Amelia recalled that she lost consciousness upon entering the sanctuary, something Garfield confirmed was the sign of someone worthy, stating that those who were worthy were all halves. Fearing for her safety, Subaru asked Garfield to accompany her during the trials. Nevertheless, he refused, revealing that he couldn't enter because of a contract, causing Subaru to think of looking for Otto to take his place. While she mentioned that she'd be fine, Subaru offered to scout ahead first, but Garfield advised against it, mentioning that those unworthy who were in the grave at nightfall would end up in a fate like Roswall's. Nonetheless, he decided to scout ahead anyway, which the two protested against, making him promise Emilia that he would return safely. Despite the promise, Subaru fell into a trap hole right as he entered the grave, and ten minutes after waking up in the pit, he encountered a girl who introduced herself as Echidna. Echidna, noting that Subaru was too cautious of her to talk properly, decided to change the area into a grassy plain, then invited him to have tea with her at a white table. After joking around with him, such as telling him that his tea was made of her bodily fluids, she got down to business, telling him that he was in her dreams. Subaru demanded he be sent back, though he was convinced to stay when she offered to answer any questions he had. Seeming that he was still intimidated, Echidna swapped places with Typhon, who, after some small talk, checked to see if he was an evil person by shaking his hand, deducing right after that he wasn't. However, Subaru noticed that she had pulled his right arm off, and as he panicked, she shattered both of her legs from the knee down, making him fall into her arms. He became confused even further when she introduced herself as the Witch of Pride, the feeling growing when she was replaced with Sekhmet, who commented that Subaru was the third person to meet three witches in a row, the first two being Flugel and Reed Estrella. He pleaded for her to fix his missing body parts, nevertheless she refused as she claimed it would be a hassle, leaving it to Minerva to take care of. Looking him over, Minerva quickly deduced that it was the work of Typhon, lamenting about conflict while she repeatedly punched him to heal him. Once she finished, she made him promise to not get injured, telling him that she would heal him even if he did, then swapped places with Echidna, who asked him if that proved how harmless she was compared to the others, to which he referred to her as a witch. As they returned to the table, Echidna revealed that she had collected the souls of the other witches, since it had been important to her while they were still alive. 
Going through various topics, such as Daphne's three great demon beasts and Reed, the topic eventually ended up at Echidna's situation, who Subaru was curious about since she was said to be deceased. Confirming that she was dead, she explained that she was confined to the grave by the dragon Volcania as a deterrent to Satella, as her seal wasn't firm, nor was the dragon immortal. She also expressed somewhat of an interest in Roswell, mentioning that Roswell was a little too earnest, willing to give up their own life for a single purpose. A while later, the effects of the tea she served him started to take effect, prompting her to tell him what he drank was without a doubt her bodily fluids, which were helping the witch factors inside his body settle in. Listening to her explanation, Subaru realized that she spoke similarly to Puck. As he was about to leave, Echidna made him promise not to tell anyone what he learned and allow the witch factors to anchor themselves inside of him, and in exchange, she would allow him to take the trials in Amelia's place, remarking that he seemed to have made a similar contract with someone. A short while later, Subaru awoke in a building in the village, then made his way with Amelia to the house Roswell was staying in, where Amelia declared that she would take the trials. The next night, Subaru visited the grave with Amelia and Ryuzu, and the two waited outside while she took the trial. The lights in the grave suddenly went out, prompting him to run in and help her. Immediately, he heard a phrase telling him to face his past and ended up in his room in Japan. After interacting with his parents for a while, he decided to go to school for the first time in a while, where he encountered Echidna wearing his school's female uniform. Subaru went over the details with her, thanking her for letting him tell his parents what he wanted to say, even if they were fake, before leaving the trial. Subaru awoke near Amelia, who he saw was struggling with her trial, causing him to go over to her. He woke her up, however, the stress from what she saw during the trial made her mentally unstable, forcing him to carry her back to the village. She recovered later that day, and while she was surprised that he passed the first trial, she refused to have him take it in her place, stating that she would take it alongside him. Unfortunately, they quickly found out that he couldn't move on until she finished, which she was unable to do as she spent the next three nights failing her trial, earning Garfield's annoyance. Faced with the results, Subaru negotiated with Garfield to release the hostages in exchange for him to take the trial instead of Amelia, to which both sides agreed. Later that day, he returned to the village with the hostages, then visited Roswell's mansion to take care of things when he noticed something was strange. As he looked for Frederica and Petra, he was killed by Elsa in Roswell's room, who reminded him of what she said to take care of their bowels until the next time she appeared. Returning from death, he quickly realized that he was in the graveyard after the first trial. Going through the same situations as the previous loop, he brought Amelia back to the house, however this time around, Garfield objected to him participating in the trials. He tried protesting Garfield and Ryuzu's decision to Roswald, though when he refused to do anything about it, he asked about Amelia's past instead, learning that she had frozen her entire village in Ellier Forest in the past. Leaving Roswald's house, he decided to head to the grave only to be intercepted by Garfield, who had been patrolling the area as he knew Subaru was going to try something. Subaru demanded to know why he was blocking his way, causing Garfield to tell him that he smelled like the witch, which is why he didn't trust him at all. He tried the next morning, but saw that Garfield was still there and ended up going to Ryuzu's temporary house to talk with her. While there, he noticed a contradiction in her words about whether she took the test or not, though the only thing she said in response was that no one in the sanctuary could lie. The next day, with Roswell's counsel, the hostages were freed and Subaru led them back to the village with him stopping at the mansion to ask Frederica about Garfield, though she told him that she couldn't tell him much because of her contract with Roswell. To begin her story, Frederica told him about the Demi-Human War, then moved on from there to her family, explaining how they ended up with Roswell. She revealed that they had been able to leave the sanctuary as they were quartered, nevertheless, Garfield refused to leave, stating that he wouldn't leave the others behind. Once the decision was finished, Subaru tried searching around for the entrance to the library, and when he opened the door, he was immediately attacked by Elsa. Subaru returned from death once again in the grave, and just like his two previous loops, he took Amelia back to her house before heading over to Roswell's house to interrogate him about everything. During the questioning, he learned that Roswell also had a gospel book, which Roswell referred to as one of the only two complete books owned by him and Beatrice, making him realize that he knew everything that happened. Subaru accused him of letting Rem die, leading him to ask who she was, and at that point he lost it and tried to attack Roswell but was stopped by Garfield, who smashed the right side of his face in. He was subsequently placed in a cell, though he was rescued three days later by Otto, then, with Ram's assistance, led the villagers out of the sanctuary. As they neared the barrier, Garfield blocked their path. Nevertheless, he agreed to let them pass as long as Subaru remained, yet in spite of that, he tried to kill him once they left, forcing Ram to hold him back to let Subaru leave with the villagers. Her actions angered him, causing him to beastify and chase after the villagers, beginning to massacre them when they tried to prevent him from killing him. Subaru himself tried to help, but was thrown off into the distance by Patrash. 
Returning to the scene a little while later, he was confused as to why there were no bodies, his confusion increasing when he saw that there was no one in the sanctuary either. Confused and tired, he made his way to the grave, and on the way there, he encountered the Osagi and was eaten again. Subaru returned from death again, however, this time, Echidna brought him to a second tea party, where they went over his return from death ability. As they wrapped up the topic, he shifted the topic of discussion to his most recent death, and after he explained how he died, she informed him that he was killed by the Osagi, one of the three great demon beasts created by the Witch of Gluttony, Daphne. Hearing this, he requested to see the witch. The two argued about the demon beasts, causing Daphne to make him experience extreme hunger, which he recovered from a short time later thanks to Minerva's punch. Wary of her after experiencing hunger, he declared that he would get rid of the Osagi, which she laughed at, and soon after she switched places with Echidna. As his body began to awaken in the grave, Echidna took Petra's handkerchief as the cost for her help. He awoke in the grave but then realized that Amelia wasn't with him, prompting him to go look outside since he had a bad feeling about this. Once outside, he was shocked to see that the entire sanctuary was enveloped in shadow, quickly coming face to face with the Witch of Envy's shadow. The witch tried to absorb him, though fortunately Garfield saved him, explaining that everyone else had been swallowed by the shadows. The witch continued to try to absorb him, forcing Subaru's allies to try to fight her, however they were quickly killed by the shadow. The shadow then approached him, trying to absorb him once again, but this time a light shone from his chest, its source Petra's handkerchief that he had given Echidna earlier. As Echidna had modified it, the handkerchief hardened in accordance to his will, allowing him to use it as a weapon to cut away the shadows trying to absorb him. Using the handkerchief, he cut his way straight to the witch but was shocked when he saw it was Amelia behind the shadows, his agitation allowing the witch to ensnare him in her shadows again. Seeing that there was no other choice, Subaru slit his throat with the handkerchief, and he died realizing that the witch was controlling Amelia's body, leading him to promise to save her. Subaru awoke in the grave like before, though unlike the other loops, this time he discussed the trials with Amelia after he woke her up. The events that followed were the same as the previous loops, but this time he stayed with Amelia for a while to discuss the trials a bit more, this time lying to her about taking the trial himself. Once he finished, he questioned Ram about Roswell's gospel book, then was interrogated outside by Garfield. When he questioned Garfield about Ryuzu, the boy immediately became angry, claiming that he wouldn't understand the things that they've been through since he hadn't gone through hardships, causing Subaru to tell him that he'd been through something similar many times. After parting with the boy, Subaru recalled the time he met him in front of the grave while he was talking with Otto, and retraced his steps to end up at the laboratory-like place he had been teleported to by Beatrice. Making his way inside the building, he was shocked to see Ryuzu inside of a huge crystal, but quickly regained his composure to analyze the situation. Noting that the room placement was strange, he checked the walls as he thought there was an extra room hidden somewhere, and as he turned toward the door to check the other room, he met eyes with another Ryuzu who had just arrived. After they arrived at Ryuzu's temporary house, she explained to him that the Ryuzu Meyer inside of the crystal was the real girl and that all the other Ryuzus he had seen were copies of the original, which she revealed were created by crafting an artificial ode through a special spell and creating the rest of the body through mana, adding that all Ryuzu created were given enough intelligence to follow orders from birth. This led him to realize that the copies were being created to experiment with immortality, Though she pointed out that Echidna's experiment hadn't been successful, as the copies weren't a good enough vessel to hold her soul, explaining that because of this, the few copies that experienced it had broken personalities, and that it was troublesome to get rid of them, as they had fragments of the Witch of Greed's power. She continued by telling him that aside from the four that acted as Ryuzu, the rest of the copies acted as eyes and messengers, revealing that it took three days for one of the four copies to recharge, further explaining that Subaru was able to order the copies around as he was a disciple of Greed. He had no idea what she meant until he told her about Echidna's tea, which she confirmed was the cause. Gathering the information in his mind, he left Amelia a note, then had the copies help him escape from the sanctuary, making sure to take Petaljuice's gospel book along with him, which he somehow became able to read. Arriving at the mansion half a day later, he asked Petra to stay home for the next week, then discussed Garfield with Frederica, learning that Garfield had taken the trial before in the past. Afterward, he visited Beatrice in the library, telling her his reasons, which she reacted to every time he presented more information, and he dealt the finishing blow by mentioning that she was most likely Echidna's contract spirit. Defeated, she dropped her gospel book to the floor, prompting him to pick it up. He was surprised that the entire book was blank, causing her to mention that it had been that way for years, and asked him to kill her to set her free from the contract. He refused to do so, causing her to have an emotional outburst, telling him that she had been alone for 400 years. 
When he offered to form a contract with her, she asked if he would put her first, pointing out that he wouldn't do it as that spot in his mind was already given to Amelia and Rem. Hearing this, he asked her why she was letting him finish her, but before she could answer, she was interrupted by Elsa, who was standing in the doorway with a blood-stained Kukuri knife in her hand. Surprised to see her in the library, Beatrice asked how she was able to find the place, prompting her to reveal that she left all the doors in the mansion open, as her door crossing couldn't connect to open doors. Upon hearing that she had killed Petra, Subaru cast Shamak before pulling himself and Beatrice into it. Using it to confuse Elsa while they escaped past her, Elsa caught up to them, forcing Beatrice to fight back using Yin magic. Nevertheless, Beatrice was killed by Elsa, and Elsa proceeded to repeatedly cut him before knocking him out. He awoke a while later, ignoring the terrible feeling he had, then returned to the sanctuary, eventually coming face to face with an angry Garfield, who informed him that he had taken back control of the copies, telling him that he had suspected Amelia of freezing the area just like Ellie or Forrest. Having no choice, he checked up on Amelia, who was worried about him, even mentioning that she loved him, but upon exiting the grave, he informed Garfield that she had lost her mind, and he knew that she would never depend on him like that. Before Garfield could say anything, he revealed everything he had learned about him, including the fact that Roswell was the one making it snow, pointing out that he was most likely the one who was keeping them in Sanctuary. Soon after, the two confronted Roswell about the snow, but to his surprise, he asked him if he was the one who told him that. Roswell was disappointed about Subaru's answer, but didn't deny making it snow, causing Garfield to try to attack him, which Ram prevented by holding him, earning her a comment from Roswell that she was a good follower. Subaru didn't understand what he meant until he saw him stab through both of them with his arm, then destroying Garfield's head to prevent him from beastifying, killing them both. Wiping his boots with the mattress, he proceeded to talk with Subaru, pointing that he wasn't feeling any kind of sadness over their death since he had a method to reverse it, causing him to realize that Roswell knew about his return from death. He revealed that everything that had happened in the Sanctuary had gone entirely according to plan, as he had used the snow to manipulate Garfield into making the others think it was Amelia's fault. He cast Goa repeatedly in the direction of the forest where the Osagi was just arriving at the Sanctuary. As the Osagi approached, Roswell advised him to get rid of everything except the one thing he held dear, as that would allow him to be like him, before getting eaten by the Demon Beast. Making his way back to the grave, the crazed Amelia greeted him again, this time giving him a lap pillow. As she had lost her mind, Amelia didn't notice the Usagi beginning to eat him, and as he died, Amelia gave him a kiss, which he described to taste like cold death. Returning from death for the fifth time, Subaru went along with the events as normal, but this time he revealed everything he knew about Garfield to him after lying that he failed the trial, making him promise not to interfere with him. Returning to the grave, he tried to return to Echidna's realm, only to be forced into starting the second trial, which was seeing the continuation of his thirteenth death the time he killed himself after seeing Rem's name and memories were eaten. Wilhelm and Ferris tried to save him, however, the thing inside of Subaru tried to attack him. At that moment, Subaru returned to the grave, but soon after he was pulled back to the trial, this time to view his twelfth death, the time Ferris and Julius had killed him along with Petaljuice. He watched as everyone there grieved for him, with Julius stating that he had wanted to be friends with him. He was forced back into reality with his words, and after realizing that the voice that started the second trial was his own voice, he was forced to watch the continuation of another death. This time, his seventh death, where he had jumped off a cliff in front of Ram and Beatrice. Standing next to his dead body, an angry Ram tried to lash out at Beatrice, but stopped when she saw that she was crying while kneeling next to his body. Following that scene, he was forced to view the continuation of his ninth death, the time when Puck had frozen him at the Roswall Mansion after escaping Petaljuice's cave. Reinhardt had confronted Puck after Subaru's death and killed him, but not before Puck mentioned that Reinhardt could only become a hero. Once he had killed him, Reinhardt commented that Felt would be sad. Afterwards, he was forced to view his first death, the time that Elsa had killed both him and Amelia at night at the Stolen Goods warehouse. Once Elsa had killed both of them, Puck appeared to take revenge, freezing the entire area. The trial moved on to Subaru's fifth death, which was the time he was killed by Rem as he tried to make his way to Amelia's room. Once he viewed the scene, he returned to a place he didn't recognize and encountered Rem there, who he quickly realized was a fake when he heard her say things the real Rem would never say. Upon realizing that the Rem in front of him was fake, she turned into a different girl who introduced herself as Carmilla, the Witch of Lust. He demanded to know why she took Rem's form, prompting her to tell him that if he saw her as someone else, that was what he wanted to see causing him to try to make him feel his anger, though he had to be saved by Echidna, who pointed out that being captivated by Carmilla could lead to death. True to her words, the instant Echidna caught his attention, he felt intense breathlessness and dry eye from forgetting to breathe and blink. 
Leaving Subaru at the bottom of the hill, Echidna sat down at the table, telling him that she sent Carmilla to prevent him from wearing himself down and breaking from the trial. In response to her words, he sat down at the table, though he refused to drink her tea. To begin their discussion, they went over the second trial, which he correctly guessed as seeing a different future than what had actually happened, leading him to question her about returns from death. Echidna herself didn't know exactly how it worked either, causing the topic to shift to the Witch of Envy, with her explaining that the witch he encountered was an imitation of the real thing as the vessel was immature and none of her seals were broken, therefore limiting her power far below what it was at her prime, which still shocked him. Eventually, she offered to form a contract with him to help him. However, they were interrupted by Minerva, who wouldn't acknowledge it. He didn't understand what she was talking about, but with her, Carmilla, and Sekhmet's assistance, he realized that Echidna hadn't been telling him the whole truth, leading him to reject her offer. Before she could say anything in response, Satella appeared, causing Minerva to go over to her and determine who she was, with Echidna explaining that Satella and the Witch of Envy were separate personalities. Minerva determined that the woman in front of her was Satella and suggested to him to talk with her. Through his conversation with Satella and the other witches, Subaru learned to come to terms with himself and promised to save Satella even though she asked him to kill her. Subaru returned to reality the next morning to find himself outside the grave, learning soon after from Otto that Patrash had braved injuries to pull him out. Afterward, he tried to enter the grave to check where the next trial was, only to realize that his right to take the trials had been revoked, which he confirmed by trying to take authority over the Ryuzu copies, only to fail to do so. Not knowing what else to do, he visited Roswell that night to go over information, leading to an intellectual battle between the two to try to outdo one another. Partway through the battle, Subaru revealed that Echidna revoked his right to the trials, causing Roswell to panic as that future wasn't listed in his gospel book, his agitation making him slip that he was the one who hired Elsa to kill everyone at the mansion just to strengthen Subaru's resolve. Despite his pleas, Roswell refused to order Elsa to stop stating that he would do whatever it took to complete Subaru. Leaving Roswell's house, Subaru met Amelia, who he tried to convince to wait in completing the trials until he found a better way. Nonetheless, she refused his offer, telling him that she couldn't always depend on him. He fell asleep in the woods that night and was woken by Garfield the next day, then cheered up by Otto, who promised to help, making him realize what to do as he returned to Roswell to make a bet. He told Roswell that he would do what he wanted to do in his current loop, but if he died because of it, he would obediently listen to him the next time. Claiming he would gain Garfield as an ally and have Amelia pass the trials, he made a bet contract with Roswell, who didn't really think he would be able to accomplish it. Their contract sealed, Subaru returned to Otto to discuss their next move. Heading to the laboratory to deal with his first condition, he discussed Garfield's actions with Ryuzu, coming to the conclusion that one of the other four main Ryuzus was instructing him to oppose the sanctuary being set free. That night, he visited Amelia, and with some encouragement, he managed to convince her to discuss what she saw in the trial. Right after that, he realized that Puck wasn't sleeping at all, causing him to speak with him telepathically, revealing to him that Amelia was unconsciously making him unable to materialize because of her fear of the past. Puck explained that the only way she would get through the trials was for him to break their contract, and that he wanted Subaru to support her while he was gone. The next morning, she had an emotional outburst for most of the morning, finally falling asleep near noon, letting Subaru meet the Ryuzu he dubbed as Ryuzu Sigma. During their meeting, Subaru learned that Ryuzu Theta was the one he needed to see before regrouping with Otto to visit Roswell, where Otto had him agree not to interfere with them directly. He visited Amelia soon after, who asked him to hold her hand until morning. However, he was forced to break his promise to prepare, causing her to disappear the next morning. Ryuzu Theta also disappeared the next morning, forcing Subaru and Otto to find her before Garfield in order to ask what they needed to ask. Though fortunately, Subaru found her at Garfield and Frederica's old house, who explained what she saw during the trial, then agreed to support him in his effort to set the sanctuary free. Following Ryuzu Theta's story, he had a decent idea of where Amelia was and headed there to speak with her, leaving Otto to deal with Garfield. Across the sanctuary, Garfield smelled a large number of people heading in one direction, and upon seeing Otto and some dragon carriages, he demanded to know what they were doing. He soon realized that the smell he was sensing actually came from people's clothes, and that the real villagers were already leaving the sanctuary on dragon carriage in various places, leading him to consider going to the grave to stop Subaru and Amelia from meeting. However, Otto prevented him from doing so, using various tricks to keep his attention. Eventually, Garfield tried to finish him off, however, Ram joined their fight to help him. Garfield didn't understand why they were helping Subaru, prompting both to tell him that they trusted him. Not wanting to think anymore, Garfield turned into his beastified form to finish them, but this was exactly what Ram was waiting for. With a little of Otto's help, Ram defeated Garfield, whose reasoning wasn't clear because of the tricks Otto had used on him. 
Back at the grave, Subaru had arrived to find Amelia there, subsequently asking her to talk with him. After an argument between the two about keeping promises, he decided to be strict with her, but made sure to tell her that he believed in her because he loved her, and to prove it, he kissed her, which he described tasting like hot life, unlike their previous kiss. Leaving to organize her feelings, he stepped outside to confront a wounded Garfield, with her joining soon after. Both of them pointed out that Garfield seemed to be scared of something, which he tried to deny repeatedly. Despite that, he caved in when Subaru mentioned what he had heard about Garfield's trial, prompting him to reveal the rest of the trial, telling them that their mother had died soon after leaving them in the sanctuary. And that was why he opposed the sanctuary being set free, as he believed that there was no happiness outside of it. Hearing this, Subaru decided to forcibly prove to him that he was kind-hearted, and they began their fight. Partway through the battle, Garfield tried to beastify through his attempt and was negated with a crystal stone with Puck inside of it stabbed into his right shoulder that sucked all of his mana, forcing him to revert back into his original form. Although Subaru was successful in stabbing him, he had to cast Shamak to accomplish it, resulting in his damaged gate to completely collapse. Even then, Garfield refused to surrender. Nonetheless, Subaru defeated him by uppercutting him with an unseen hand, then having Patrash slam into him. Ten minutes later, Otto joined them with an injured ram on his back. Regrouping together again, Ram talked Garfield into retaking the trial, to which he agreed, entering the grave to begin the trial. To his surprise, the reason his mother left was to bring back their father, and not because she wanted to live her own life. After talking it over with an image of a young Frederica, Garfield decided to help those who needed him, leading him to start referring to Subaru as boss once he returned. Before Amelia took her turn with the trial, each member present gave her advice except for Subaru, with whom she discussed that they would sort out what they did in the grave later, sending her off into the grave with confidence. To her surprise, she saw that Subaru had carved pictures and words inside the first room to cheer her up, making her realize what he had done when he left her the night before when she asked him to hold her hand until morning. When Amelia was inside the grave, Subaru discussed Garfield's former stance and was puzzled by it, as none of the Ryuzu recalled telling him to be wary of Subaru and Amelia. Leaving her to focus on the trials, Subaru's group returned to Roswell's house to speak with him, where they encountered a fifth main Ryuzu, Kapi, whom he dubbed Ryuzu Omega, who had no intention of blocking their efforts to free the sanctuary. The two entered Roswell's room to find it was in a mess, as Roswell had raged for a short while. Seeing Garfield with him, he began to mock him for switching sides so easily, but when Garfield calmly refuted his claims by mentioning that he had cleared the first trial, Roswell was pressured even further, beginning to redirect his insults at Amelia, causing Subaru to grab his clothes and yell at him, demanding to know if he tried caring about her even once. Telling him that Amelia would succeed, he announced himself to be her knight, then left with Otto and Garfield to stop Elsa. Back at the mansion, Frederica arrived just in time to prevent Elsa from attacking Petra, with Garfield taking her place soon after, telling her to go help the others. Meanwhile, Subaru tried to convince Beatrice to leave with her but failed, making her kick him out of the library. Soon after, Otto and Petra joined him, informing him that a horde of demon beasts had surrounded the mansion, making it impossible to escape, and at that moment they were attacked by Elsa, who had left her battle with Garfield. Luckily, Frederica joined in with Rem strapped on her back. The group left Garfield behind to deal with their enemies as they looked for an exit. Dealing with the other demon beasts along the way, the group eventually reached the hallway with the entrance to Roswell's room, where one of Maylee's trump cards, the Guilty Low, was standing guard to prevent anyone from escaping through the passageway. Putting their skills together, they managed to trick the demon beast into heading into their traps one after another, with Subaru trying to finish it off with a dust explosion in the kitchen, and when that failed, Otto covered it with the oil he had and burned it to death. Unfortunately, he used too much oil, allowing the fire to quickly spread across the mansion. The group quickly returned to Roswell's room, where Subaru announced that he would stay to take care of Beatrice. Searching around, Subaru tried multiple times to enter the library, and each time Beatrice kicked him out for a total of seven attempts. The library itself was a mess as the area itself was breaking apart and the fire was beginning to burn through the room. This time, Subaru successfully convinced Beatrice to accept him, telling her that even if she lived longer than him, he'd make sure that she'd never forget him, prompting her to finally refer to him by name. The two escaped the library by teleporting to the sanctuary, much to the relief of everyone else. A short while later, the Osagi came as expected, though fortunately Subaru and Beatrice teleported near her at the grave to help fight against them. Subaru, Amelia, and Beatrice worked together to lessen their numbers until Beatrice sent them to a different dimension with Al Shamak. Seeing that they won, Subaru began celebrating by praising Beatrice while holding her up. Outside, as Subaru finished his Puck Snow sculptures, Emilia decided to go over what they did in the grave, causing him to be confused as she apparently thought that babies were made when a man and a woman kissed. He thought about correcting her misunderstanding, though he eventually decided to leave it to Ram and Frederica. Garfield, Frederica, Otto, Petra, and Rem arrived at the sanctuary half a day later along with their prisoner Maylee and immediately took turns punching Roswell for everything that he'd done. 
Once they were finished, the group gathered in the cathedral to discuss their current situation, with Roswell swearing on Echidna's soul that he wouldn't attempt anything like what he did again. Nevertheless, Garfield was still suspicious of him, which Subaru took care of by having Roswell promise to make up for everything he had done, especially to the villagers and sanctuary citizens. Following their talk, the group dispersed. Soon after, Beatrice visited him after Roswell left and explained the conditions her contractor had to bear. Elsewhere, Echidna, who had returned to the living world by transferring her soul into the original Ryuzu Mayor's body, by using and absorbing Ryuzu Omega's own soul as a medium, renamed herself Omega after viewing the memories left in the soul. As she looked around, she decided to spend some time getting used to everything, and left. The Stars That Engrave History A year after the events at the Sanctuary, Subaru was practicing parkour at the athletic zone Garfield had made for him when Beatrice visited him. Petra arrived soon after, informing the two that there was a messenger, and therefore Amelia had requested their presence at the mansion. Upon arriving at the mansion, they were greeted by an enthusiastic Mimi, who proudly told them that she came alone before announcing that they were invited to a party hosted by Anastasia. They began playing around at the entrance until they were scolded by Ram, at which point the involved parties gathered in the parlor. Subaru quickly introduced himself to their other guest, Joshua Juculius, and then got straight down to business, which was mostly the same as what Mimi had said, except for the fact that it would be held in the city of Priestella, which was next to the border between Lagunica and Kararagi. Subaru questioned about whether they should go, however they were convinced to go by Joshua, who mentioned that Anastasia had asked him to tell him that they would find an extremely high-purity magic stone that could house Puck inside of it. Arriving in the city 12 days later, the group headed to the Water Plumage Inn, and Anastasia greeted them in front of the building while Otto left to take their Earth Dragons to the stable. Later, Subaru, Ferris, and Julius watched Garfield fight against Reinhardt in the inn to see how strong he was, though he was easily dealt with by the Sword Saint who didn't even move from where he was standing. Afterwards, Subaru visited the same park with Amelia and Beatrice to see Liliana again, but this time Priscilla was there, impressing the crowd with her dancing. Immediately after, the crowd both of them was near stopped to look up at the nearby Time Tower where Sirius was standing, who introduced herself the same way as Petaljuice. Seeing her caution those who were about to attack her, Subaru tried to negotiate with her instead of summoning Beatrice, at which point she brought out Luzbel Callard, explaining that he had volunteered to be her prisoner to protect his friend Tina. The crowd praised him for his efforts, making Sirius elated that there was love, subsequently throwing him off the tower to his death, then made everyone in the group die the same way with her authority of wrath. Returning from death at Liliana, he decided to take Beatrice with him, explaining to her the threat that they were going to face to see how much he could tell her before the hands blocked him. To their surprise, Emilia also tagged along, agreeing to assist them in the fight against Sirius. Eventually, Sirius tried to finish her off, though fortunately she was saved by Regulus, causing Sirius to try to kill him. Taking a look at Subaru, Sirius declared him to be her missing husband, Petaljuice, and tried to claim him. Before she could do so, Regulus blocked her again, though right after, both of their gospel books reacted, giving them both a new entry. Prioritizing their work, Regulus left Subaru with a serious injury to his right leg, and Sirius spread it to everyone except Beatrice and Amelia as they weren't worthy of being loved, and then the two Sin Archbishops left. Subaru later awoke in a slightly dark room, which Ferris referred to as a field hospital subsequently being briefed on the situation a little by both him and Ricardo, knowing that Beatrice was currently unconscious, because she used up all of her mana to keep all of the people affected by Sirius' authority alive. At that moment, Capella Emirata Lugunica began her second broadcast on the city center's broadcast meteor, warning the people of Priestella to not try anything, as they had taken over the four control towers that controlled the waterways. Subaru and Krush ended up entering the broadcast preparation room through the window from the roof, quickly dispatching the Black Dragon inside once they saved the hostage girl at its feet. But when he opened the door to the broadcast room, he found a large number of human-sized flies. Hearing her scream behind him, Subaru turned around to see an unconscious and injured Krush at the girl's feet, with the girl insulting them in Capella's voice. Grabbing Krush's body, he tried to escape from her but failed, causing her to infect him with her own blood that she mentioned to include dragon blood, wondering if either of them would survive the experience. Leaving them behind, she tried to make her way to the announcement room when the dragon she had transformed returned and attacked her with fire just as he lost consciousness. Subaru awoke a while later, learning soon after from Julius that the witch cult had abandoned the city center along with the fact that the area around his leg injury had healed but had turned black. Anastasia traded places with the others while they went to check up on Krush, revealing to Subaru the existence of the artificial spirit she wore, who introduced herself as Echidna. Despite his shock, both girls continued on with the conversation, telling him one of the witch cult's conditions during their third announcement was for them to hand over the artificial spirit, though they didn't know which spirit they were referring to. She then told him the other four conditions. The second condition was the Book of Wisdom that was supposedly in the city, the third was for them to deliver 20 couples to a control tower, and the fourth was for them to not bother Regulus's wedding with the silver-haired bride. 
Seeing his reaction, she expressed her desire to disobey the witch cult, and then went down with him to the first floor to discuss their plan with the others. During their discussion, Al arrived at the city center, causing him to tag along with Subaru and Garfield, who were planning to visit evacuation centers. Along the way, Subaru realized that Sirius was using her authority to increase the emotions of people, making them hurry to the nearest evacuation center, but just as they feared, the citizens had begun killing each other because of it. Subduing the remaining citizens, they returned to the city center, where Subaru suggested to Anastasia to use the loudspeaker meteor to help the citizens to calm down. Following a brief discussion, Al suggested that Subaru make the call, as he was the one known for killing a Sin Archbishop, which the others agreed to. He quickly began his speech, successfully raising the morale of everyone, enough to make Anastasia ask if he used to be a swindler. After receiving praise from everyone, Otto reappeared with Reinhardt, who apologized for his tardiness, explaining that Heinkel had taken Felt hostage during their meeting earlier just so he could have Reinhardt protect his own like at the cost of everyone else's. Otto continued from where he left off, explaining that he helped Felt escape from Heinkel, allowing Reinhardt to capture him. Otto himself had been meeting with Kirataka at the time of the announcement, adding that Roy had appeared in the same avenue and soon after began causing a commotion, and that Kirataka had made him escape through the secret passageway down to the underground waterways before being cut down. At that point, the topic shifted to Roy's intentions, leading Otto to reveal that he was the one who brought the Book of Wisdom to the city, revealing that he had given it to a restorer to bring it back to its former condition. With the information about the book known to everyone, both Anastasia and Subaru decided to reveal the existence of artificial spirits. While the others briefed Priscilla on the situation, Subaru took Otto outside to discuss the book, learning that he had brought it to make sure Roswell was on their side. Satisfied with his explanation, both of them were about to return to the room when Wilhelm stopped them, informing him that Krush wanted to see him. Making their way to Krush's room, Wilhelm revealed the identities of the two witch cult members they had fought, hesitating a little when he was about to mention Theresia's name. After giving him a story of the Sphinx, they arrived at Krush's room, and Subaru entered to find her struggling against the dragon blood that had infected her body. To their surprise, he was able to take the curse from her body, however the rate it transferred at wasn't equal, causing her to stop him from taking any more of the curse from her. He assured her that he would take care of things before leaving the room. At a church near one of the control towers, Regulus tried to force Amelia into marrying him, nevertheless she refused, stating that she already had someone she was going to love when she properly understood what love was before Subaru and Reinhardt kicked the door open. Unfortunately for them, Regulus grabbed Amelia's throat, forcing Reinhardt to comply with his request, which was for him to take an attack without protecting himself in exchange for the hostage's freedom. Regulus took advantage of this by killing Reinhardt in one strike, subsequently attempting to kill Subaru as well. However, to their surprise, Reinhardt got back up thanks to his divine protection of the Phoenix. Shocked that he was alive, Regulus was unable to do anything to prevent Subaru from rescuing the 184th wife nearby with his whip, Emilia from kicking the ice sword to Reinhard, and Reinhard from attacking him with it. The celebration was cut short when they saw Regulus get back up, making Reinhard resume the fight. After several attempts, such as trying to drown him, make him receive his own attack, and attack from below, Subaru remembered the story behind the star Regulus, asking Reinhard to check if Regulus's heart was functioning. At that moment, Emilia realized that she had his heart inside of her, leading Subaru to use his unseen hand to carefully crush Regulus's heart without damaging hers. Reinhardt hit Regulus high into the air with his sword, then kicked him down into the ground. Vowing to get revenge on them, he tried digging his way back up using his authority, only to make the mistake of digging into a waterway, and soon died of the water and mud suffocating him. A short while later, Subaru and Amelia returned to free the women from the ice, where he felt a mysterious black object enter his chest. A short while later, Kirataka announced on the loudspeaker meteor that the witch cult had been defeated, much to the joy of everyone in the city. Subaru and Amelia quickly returned to the ruined city center building, where they regrouped with the others, promptly hearing of everyone's survival. Spending some time with each of them, he listened to Liliana's song over the loudspeaker meteor. Partway through, they visited an evacuation center where he, after discussing the Book of Wisdom a little with Otto, learned that a Sin Archbishop was being held prisoner in the next evacuation center over. Heading there immediately, he discovered that the Sin Archbishop in question was Sirius, who refused to properly talk with him unless Amelia and Beatrice left forcing him to have them temporarily leave so he could talk with the witch cult member. Eventually, Subaru got too close to her, allowing her to lick him, causing his disgust to grow due to her authority, and fortunately, Amelia intervened, knocking her away from him to protect him. As he was about to leave, Sirius warned him to be careful of gourmet, or bizarre eating, and satiation, asking him to kill them since they were a brother to her, making him realize that they were the three sin archbishops of gluttony. Fearing that someone might have been eaten, he left the evacuation center in a hurry to check, and while he did so, he met Julius, who he quickly learned had gotten his name eaten once he saw Amelia wonder who he was. Later on, Subaru visited Anastasia, telling her that the number of people heading to the tower was currently five, which included himself, Amelia, Beatrice, Anastasia herself, and Julius. 
Anastasia questioned why Echidna wasn't involved, prompting him to reveal that he knew the Anastasia in front of him was still the artificial spirit of Echidna, leading her to drop her impersonation to discuss her current situation, revealing that she was unable to leave her body, which is why she suggested going to the tower in the first place. He agreed to work with her, but decided to head back to Roswell's mansion first. The Corridor of Memories Making their way to Roswell's mansion, Subaru, Amelia, and Beatrice head there with Julius and Anastasia, who were accompanying them in the same dragon carriage. After being greeted by both Petra and Ram, the group made their way to the parlor where Roswell was waiting. He had already learned of their plan through their letter, allowing their conversation to move along smoothly, though when it came to the topic about the effects of the Authority on Gluttony, he noted that Subaru seemed to remember Julius just like Rem, telling him that he should take care of it as it meant he was special, and added right after that it's something many people couldn't get even if they wanted it. The group soon dispersed to take care of business. During the time before their departure, Subaru visited Rem, telling her that they might be able to save her. He was then interrupted by Ram, who, after several insults toward him for supposedly acting like a perverted man, shocked him by informing him that she was going with them. Upon arriving to the closest town, Marula, the group spent that day and the next three getting ready for their attempt, learning that there were three sand times that raged every day, then left the day after. During their way up the tower, Subaru and Ram visited the green room on Alcyone, a room that was covered in plants that was essentially one spirit that tried to heal anyone inside. He noted that Patrash was healing, but Ram wasn't, making him renew his resolve to save her, and left the room to return the others while Ram stayed behind to take care of Ram. The rest of the group made their way up to the third lair, Tegeta, to find themselves in a completely white space with a floating monolith right in front of the stairs that they just climbed. The others told him not to touch the monolith, and when he did, the room was filled with light, which transformed the surroundings into the Tegeta library. Ascending the stairs soon after, the group arrived in a white room that looked exactly the same as the one on the lair below, making them question if they arrived at the correct lair. Fortunately, the room was different, as instead of a monolith, there was a sword stuck in the center of the room. Subaru made his way to the center of the room, and upon grasping the sword, a voice told him that like a fool that arrived at the heavenly sword, he needed to obtain his forgiveness. As he looked where the others were looking, he noticed that a man with long red hair had appeared, who kept on repeating what the voice said. Following a brief talk, the man noticed they were in the white room. He then told Julius to try to move him from his position if he wanted to get him to talk, later introducing himself as a simple stick swinger. The fight began with Julius's attack, though the man effortlessly stopped it with a pair of chopsticks. As he looked around to find his next opponent, Emilia activated Ice Bren Art's icicle line, creating a barrier of ice particles around the man and confronted him. He admitted his defeat, but only to Emilia, as she was the only one so far that was able to move him. As Subaru began despairing over the fact that there was no way the rest of the group could win, Melee suggested for them to retreat for the time being, and the man agreed, stating that he had gotten bored and would close up shop for now. Back on the fourth lair, the group discussed their situation with Ram. The group began to wonder who the long-haired man was, as Ram had pointed out that there were only three others that were around Reinhardt's level. Fortunately for them, Shala soon woke up, and with Ram's help they succeeded in getting her to reveal that the man was Reed Astria. Eventually, the four of them came upon Julius being launched across one of the aisleways in their retreat. Reed soon appeared after him. Julius quickly told them that he had a piece of good news and bad news to tell them. The good news was that he didn't need to worry about gluttony, but the bad news was that the one before him, Reed Astrea, was Roy Alfard. After this shocking revelation, Subaru came to the conclusion that Roy Alfard had taken Reed's form. However, Reed told him that they were misunderstanding. Julius corrected his words and told him that though Roy ate Reed's memories, it was Reed's own spirit that took control. When Reed wouldn't move aside from the aisleway, Amelia and the others began to fight with him again. To make matters worse, Satella appeared as well, shortly afterwards, causing Reed to duel with them. Realizing he'd failed, Subaru braced himself for death, wishing that the now unconscious Ram would stay alive just a second longer than him. Following that, Reed killed Subaru with a torrent of light. Returning from death, Subaru told Julius and Beatrice about how Reed and Gluttony would come into contact with each other. They hastened up to Elektra and found Reed manhandling Roy Alfard, eventually rendering him unconscious. After Julius expressed his disapproval at Reed tormenting him, Reed woke up Roy and challenged him to eat him. Roy took him up to the challenge and used his authority to eat him. Reed's form vanished and a few moments later a change occurred in Roy himself. His body changed into Reed's as the latter's personality took over and Reed was reborn. The newly reborn Reed looked at Subaru and said he was disgusting. However, Julius interceded and announced that he was his opponent. A fight broke out between them and Reed quickly made short work of Julius. Immediately after, Reed continued his attack and cut Subaru down, wounding him fatally. Just before he died, Subaru renewed his determination and announced that this was Count One. Subaru died once again and returned by death to the library. 
Having all been brought up to speed, Subaru affirmed his determination to completely disrupt the gluttonous feast that those three terrible siblings had started with the bonds that they had. The others all voiced their agreement at this. Subaru swiftly explained to them the problems they were facing in the tower, likening the situation to the game Othello, with the four corners representing the two gluttonies, the demon beasts, and their so-to-speak comrade Shala. He warned that Shala would turn on them if one of the rules of the tower was broken. Soon after, Subaru pointed that two of the corners were already being dealt with thanks to Beatrice's command initiative. Ram butted in and pointed out that she knew that Melee was holding back the swarm of demon beasts, but didn't know about the other one. Subaru replied that it was Julius using his Corleonis to pinpoint his location to the second floor in the middle of fighting Reed Estrella. With those situations already ongoing, Subaru began to divide the members to tasks for upcoming battles. A short while after assigning them their roles, Subaru and Ram had a short conversation. She told Subaru that she wouldn't hold back as he was going to use his Corleonis ability to take her burden. She told Subaru not to die because otherwise he wouldn't be able to remember Rem before she took her leave, leaving Subaru with Amelia and Beatrice. An unspecified time later, over at the fourth floor balcony, Shaola and Meili were trying to keep the demon beasts at bay along with Echidna. However, it was at this moment that one of the tower rules was broken and Shaola began to transform. As her transformation process began, Subaru leapt out onto the balcony. This caused Shala to ask him to order her, however, Subaru refused, telling her that he wouldn't tell her to die, that he wouldn't let her keep crying, and that he wouldn't let her end her 400 years here. Shala told Subaru that she loved him and that she fully transformed. Beatrice used Murak on her with Meili using a Hanemogura to push her away. Having bought them a bit more of a reprieve, Subaru called out to Meili and Echidna. Echidna realized he'd gotten his memories back by seeing the look of pride on Beatrice's face next to him. Subaru quickly brought her up to speed on things, including on who Amelia was, before then asking her to go up to the second floor with Amelia and join up with Julius, who was fighting. He mentioned that he'd told Amelia what to do after that, while he and Beatrice would stay back with Meili to deal with Shaola in her scorpion form and the demon beasts. With Subaru relying on Amelia, who was his key to solving the situation for the tower, Echidna and Amelia parted ways leaving Subaru and the others to fight their battle. At the same time as Subaru, Beatrice, and Meili continued their fight against Shala and the Demon Beasts, Emilia and Echidna made their way to the second floor. Having learned of Emilia's task, Echidna asked her what the basis was in being able to break the deadlock in the situation if she went up to the first floor of the tower. Emilia replied saying that Subaru had heard the fifth rule of the tower from Shala, and that since it was something Subaru had come up with, she was sure it was the right thing to do. The two of them finally arrived at Electra and found Julius locked in a fierce battle with Reed. Emilia butted into their fight, and after a brief exchange between the two people present, Emilia tried to look for an opportunity to get past Reed and go up to the first floor. Reed spotted this and told her that he didn't think he'd let her go as she liked. He tried to stop her, but was unable to, because Emilia, although he had forgotten her, had already passed the trial. Emilia headed to the stairs that led further up into the floor and called out to Julius, giving him her name and vowing they'd see each other later. She rushed up the stairs, leaving Julius to fight Reed with Echidna cheering him on. As their duel raged on, Emilia ran up the stairs and made it to the first floor, which was up on the rooftop of the tower. There, she was greeted by Vulcania, who invited her to step through the first floor as the almighty petitioner who'd managed to reach the top of the tower. Vulcania further declared that he would ask the will of the one who'd reached the top in accordance with the ancient covenant, also while looking down upon Emilia. Meanwhile, Lai, bemoaning that he couldn't properly use the name he'd eaten or get in contact with Royer Louis, encountered Ram atop the spiral staircase. Looking down on Lai, Ram declared with cold eyes that she'd heard he was the one who'd tore apart her and Ram's sisterly love before telling him to die squealing like a pig. The Land of the Wolves As soon as the smoke and dust settled, still shell-shocked Ram and Amelia frantically searched the green room, trying to locate Subaru and Ram, but to no avail. Upon realizing that the duo vanished from the Pleiades Watchtower, Ram and Amelia regroup with Anastasia, Julius, Artificial Spirit Echidna, Meili, and Beatrice in order to discuss the events that had just took place. They note how the shadows that attacked the tower moments prior were dispersed by the Divine Dragon and how without his help, all of them would have definitely died, as well as pointing out Subaru's disappearance. With a new goal set, saving Subaru and Rem, the squad starts to devise a plan to locate and save them. Anastasia remarks about how they could have been dead, considering how they were swallowed by shadows. However, Beatrice calms everyone down by confirming Subaru is still alive, as she can feel his state due to their contract. Ram quickly follows suit, explaining that she can feel Ram being alive as well through her synesthesia. 
After everyone calmed down, they started debating on what actually happened. Julius suggested the shadow most likely acted as a substitute for shadow magic, to which Beatrice adds that it was most likely a form of shamak, and how it was likely the cause for Subaru and Ram's teleportation. With all that info in hand, Ram and Beatrice were able to give a rough location of the lost duo, the very south of the world, somewhere in the Empire of Valachia. Julius then remarks what a terrifyingly bad situation that would be, as the Empire and the Kingdom did sign a non-aggression pact. However, a couple months ago, the Empire closed their borders with the Kingdom, not letting anyone trespass until the end of the royal election. Just as it seemed the situation couldn't get any worse, Ram informed the group that the Third Sin Archbishop of Gluttony is with them. The scene switches to a new location, now confirmed to be the neighboring Empire of Valachia, where Subaru is crying and hugging the just-woken Rem. But to Subaru's horror, Rem doesn't remember who she is or who Subaru is, even asking who he meant when he called a person named Rem. As Subaru is trying to calm her down and explain the situation, Rem lunges at him, tackling him to the ground and positioning herself on top of him. She starts choking him and demands answers from the boy, who's unable to even speak due to the shock. Just as he's about to pass out, Louie lunges at Rem, successfully getting her off Subaru and saving his life, to which Subaru doesn't react nicely, screaming at the Archbishop to leave Rem alone. He apologizes to the blue-haired girl and explains the basics to her, when it hits him that she's displaying the same symptoms as Krush did a bit over a year ago. Rem notes how her legs feel weak, adding how even if she wanted to, she couldn't escape on her own, so she reluctantly accepts Subaru's help. The boy gives her a piggyback ride, and just as they're about to leave for the nearby forest, Rem asks what he plans to do with the innocent little girl. Subaru remarks that the girl is a very evil person, so it's best to leave her alone, and starts walking toward the forest. As soon as he makes the first step, however, Rem headlocks him and starts choking him. Both tumble to the ground, however, Rem only tightens her grip. Just as he's about to pass out, Rem mocks him for lying to her, despite having such a foul smell. Subaru immediately realizes why Rem appeared so hostile. It was due to the witch's miasma. In the very next moment, Subaru loses his consciousness. Upon waking up, Subaru firstly thinks that he had returned by death, however, due to the pain in his neck, he comes to a conclusion that he was simply knocked out for a couple hours. He immediately jumps on his feet and starts searching for the two girls who were nowhere to be found. He notices a trail of flattened grass, indicating that something was dragged off into the woods. He decides to follow the trail and enters what appears to be a rainforest. Traveling through thick flora, Subaru desperately searches for Rem when he suddenly notices movement in the corner of his eye. The moment he turns around, Subaru is shot by a large arrow, pinning him to a large tree located behind him. Puking blood, he tried to understand what was happening, but the only thing he could do was call Rem's name until the bitter end. Subaru recalls back to one of his study sessions with Beatrice. She explains to Subaru how he's in a constant dangerous situation due to his gauge shattering and not being able to absorb and disperse mana, which could lead to mana poisoning. However, Subaru doesn't pay much attention and instead teases Beatrice, agitating her in the process. As a result, she flings him into a nearby wall. Beatrice then proceeds to explain what a gate is and why Subaru is in danger, as he might explode, which makes him panic in a typical Subaru fashion. However, Beatrice pays no mind to it and explains how, as long as she's with him, she can regulate the flow of mana and prevent that from happening. After hearing that, Subaru proceeds to pick her up and spin around in circles, laughing while Beatrice's face turns bright red. Subaru wakes up and quickly realizes he had returned by death, as there are no wounds on his chest. After assessing the situation, he comes to a conclusion that the respawn point has been set after Rem strangles him, meaning that she's long gone by the time he wakes up. He rethinks about his death and even spawns the idea that Rem might be the one who shot him. However, he soon realizes the outlandishness of this and abandons it as the arrow was masterfully well-crafted, having feathers at the end and a nicely shaped and pointy tip. Rem would never be able to craft such a professional arrow in such little time. The next thing on his mind is the killer himself, who he starts calling the Hunter, and Subaru starts wondering if there's any chance to resolve the hostile situation with talking. However, he sees no leniency for negotiations from the Hunter's part. After calming himself down from the initial shock and making sure he didn't miss any important details, Subaru once again sees the flattened grass, indicating Rem's supposed path that she took. He tries using Corleonis to locate her, but is unable to, although he doesn't know if it's because she's too far away or because she doesn't view him as an ally or a friend. Just as before, he promptly follows the traces left behind by her. This time, however, Subaru makes sure not to scream her name and attract the attention of the hunter and continues traversing through the overgrown flora of the forest. He once again laments the situation and how his actions chased off Rem before shifting his hatred towards Louis. He's unsure of what she'll do now that she's alone with Rem and reiterates he has to find them as soon as possible. 
All of a sudden, Subaru finds himself in front of a new meadow. A cleared-out camp is located nearby, and after some consideration, Subaru decides to try and retrieve a knife lying down next to a makeshift bed in order to get at least a bare minimum sort of protection, in case he finds himself in a dire situation once more. As he ducks down to pick up said knife, a man appears behind him, pressing a beautifully polished blade into his throat. The man orders him to explain himself, and from the tone and sound of his voice, Subaru deduces that the man must be roughly his age, if not a bit older, as well as having a distinct way with words. The man notes that Subaru doesn't seem to be from Budheim as his skin tone is too light. As Subaru tries to complain, the man orders him to shut up or he'll decapitate him, and notices Subaru's whip, remarking that it doesn't seem like he was following him, as a whip isn't a weapon one would use in such a dense forest. Seeing Subaru silently staring at the ground, the man demands an answer from him. As soon as Subaru starts protesting, the blade pierces his skin, prompting Subaru to stiffen up as he's expecting his head to fly off. However, in the very next moment, the man orders him to slowly turn around, warning that any sudden movements will cost him his life. As he turns around, Subaru gets a general grasp of the man's appearance. He's slightly taller than him, of slender physique and long, slender limbs, dressed in fine, aristocratic clothes, and has a piece of cloth wrapped around his face, making it impossible to discern any facial features save for a pair of black eyes. The pair continues their interaction back and forth, with Subaru remarking that the man definitely isn't the hunter that killed him in the previous loop, due to the absence of a bow, a crossbow, or or arrows. Subaru then proceeded to ask the man if he can teleport or become transparent, to which the man starts inquiring him on the nature and the reason of the question. Subaru replies that as opposed to the so-called superhumans he regularly encounters on his journeys, the atmosphere the masked man is giving off isn't that of a warrior. Although Subaru thinks that such a statement would be a death sentence if stated to someone of Reinhardt's caliber, he has a strange feeling that the man won't get offended. In the very next second, the man in front of him disappears. After he reappears, he sheathes his sword and explains how holding his breath can render himself invisible, and he was, in fact, standing next to the bed he set up as bait, and watched Subaru sneak around the camp. Subaru then apologizes for intruding into his camp and asks him if he had seen a blue-haired girl wandering around, to which the man replies that Subaru was the first person that had managed to wander into his camp. Feeling disappointed, Subaru turns around and starts walking back into the forest, when the masked man stops him, telling him that he shouldn't go as he's risking his life to which Subaru states that Rem's survival is more important than his. This causes the man to offer Subaru some advice, which he reluctantly accepts. Subaru gives the man a rough rundown of how he ended up in the camp, and the masked man explains to Subaru how the tracks in the grass are fake and are meant to lead him in the wrong direction. When Subaru realizes his mistake, he thanks the man and sprints back towards the forest, but the man stops him and gives him the knife he tried to steal a bit earlier, pointing to his whip and once again explaining how useless it is in a forest. The two say their farewells, but not before Subaru introduces himself and vows to repay the favor sometime in the future, to which the man shakes his hand, prompting Subaru to promise he'll return the knife back to him. Before going, however, he gives the man a warning about the hunter, saying he's better off avoiding the forest altogether. When Subaru returns back to the grasslands he, Rem, and Louie were teleported to, he remarks how obviously fake the tracks are and easily locates a second pair of tracks, this time more similar to footprints. He points out how cautious Rem can be. She's dragging Louie around, who occasionally leaves tracks behind her due to her state. With the dagger in hand, he swiftly navigates through the forest, cutting away leaves and branches that are in the way, when suddenly, Subaru unknowingly triggers a trap created from tree branches. They slam into his left flank, sending him flying for a couple of moments. Subaru is left paralyzed on the ground. After he regains composure, he realizes that he's just started the second battle with Rem since his summoning in the New World. Did you enjoy our video? Be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.